All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming and uh, giving us some of your time this evening. Uh, I know that our, our panel is um, anxious to, to listen to uh, um, everyone's concerns and observations about the subject. Um, but uh, um, I was explaining to my colleagues here, and we're going to do introductions in a bit, that I know just about everybody in the room. So uh, hello, all, and thanks for coming again. And um, I will just... Uh, you know, we're going to kick this off. We're going to do some introductions. I'm going to lay out why we're here and what we're up to and what we're hoping to get out of uh, this evening. Um, so for those of you that may not know, my name is Dan Steck. We're in Lake George, and this is my assembly district, the 114th Assembly District. And my co-chair for this task force and I, Mike LaPetri, um, will be conducting six of these throughout the state. Uh, we had one in Herkimer last week. This is our second one, so we've had one under our belt. And uh, we'll, we'll be moving around tomorrow. We go down the Hudson Valley towards West Point, and then later on in November, we have a couple in Long Island and one in New York City. Um, and uh, the Assembly Republicans, when we're not in session uh, and uh, not making trouble in Albany, what we do, what we do is uh, we we will conduct uh, subject uh, area issues um, task force like this. Uh, in the past, I've participated in one for domestic violence. I've participated for one that we had on opiates. Um, there's a couple going on right now, workforce development, uh, but um, uh, we were asked to co-chair uh, one on water quality. Um, and uh, I think most everyone knows this. Uh, I think I was asked to, to do this uh, in large part because I'm the ranking minority member on the Environmental Conservation Committee. Um, so now I know we're in Lake George, and I'm very aware of Lake George's specific issues, but that doesn't mean that the whole panel is, and it certainly doesn't mean that I know everything there is to know about Lake George. But I anticipate tonight that we're going to hear about um, you know, the lake's water issues, and uh, you know, it is a drinking source, and we're not necessarily just here to focus on drinking uh, water supply issues. Um, but, uh, you know, so I imagine that we're going to hear a little bit about that because the lake is a, a drinking source for many as well. Um, but water, wastewater, um, those sorts of issues. So we're looking to do that, and then at the end of this process, sometime after the first of the year, we will, uh, our staff and, and we will compile a report, the report will be made public, and uh, our conference will use that as talking points and to develop legislation um, for, for next year that we, you know, that may come from this or certainly uh, uh, input into the budget process, which is what I guess a lot of the discussion um, will center on. At least it did in, in Herkimer last week. So with that said, I'd like to turn it over for the rest of our introductions and my colleague and co-chair, Michael Patrick. Mike. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. It's good to, good to know that Dan knows all of you, because I know none of you. I'm the State Assemblyman from Long Island, happy to be co-chairing alongside Dan, and really pleased to have this panel, Mary Beth Walsh and Jake Ashby, great to have you guys here. And everyone out at this panel is focused on water quality. What's the point here tonight? The, the point tonight is to be proactive. Proactive in listening and targeting issues in the capital region. So that come next year, we come to the legislature, we only, not only know the problem, but have heard also potential solutions from each and every one of you. That's what we're looking for, is help. Help and guidance to say, these are recommendations for what's gonna help the capital region. And that's how, is, that's how being the best way to be a representative is. It's not pretending that you know everything. It's speaking with the people and eliciting the knowledge and expertise from those who have been in the business for years and years and years. That's when we can go back to the legislature come 2020 and be able to identify productive solutions that we can take and ultimately hope, hopefully promulgate into law. So look forward to working with you, Dan, and this panel, and listen, listening to a really engaging dialogue. Thank you, everybody. Senator Member Walsh. So, hello, um, I'm Mary Beth Walsh. I represent the 112th Assembly District, which is just south of here and includes uh, nine towns, I won't name them all, but it's the Clifton Park, um, Half Moon, Walston kind of area, and um, uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight. I uh, am not on the uh, environmental committee. Uh, my areas generally uh, uh, revolve more around um, uh, education, uh, where I'm the minority rank on the education committee. However, um, there there are some pieces of legislation that I think are uh, really some good ideas, and I'm interested to hear what you all have to say uh, so that we can figure out, as, as Dan said, you know, what we should be really trying to emphasize or put forward um, for next year and in years to come. So uh, I'm glad to be here and uh, look forward to hearing from everybody. Thank you. 
I'm Jake Ashby. I'm a New York City Assemblyman for the 107th District. I represent Rensselaer County, North Dakota <coughs> County, and Southern Washington County. I'm not on the Environmental Committee either, but uh, there are severe <coughs> environmental issues in my district, and you know, I thought it would be important to be here, and uh, I'm grateful to be here, and I look forward to hearing from everybody and learning as much as I can, and putting forth and crafting legislation with my counterparts here to address those issues. So um, with, with that said, uh, and, and again, I know everybody here, and uh, this is you know the backyard for me. So we've all been to these uh, kinds of forums before in town board meetings. Um, we sent out invitations. It was open to the public, um, and we and we did get uh, about eight people that identified that they would like to address us. We will be happy to take uh, written uh, testimony or comment either tonight, or if you want to get it to me in the future, or any of us, you know, mail courier pigeon or whatever. Whatever we get, we will include in our final record and, and incorporate as, as uh, appropriate into our report. So if you got something in writing you want to give us, that's fine. Um, or if you want to uh, certainly come to the microphone over here. And uh, like I said, I've got a list of right now of about eight people that uh, wanted to talk. So we'll get to them first and then play by ear. If there's anyone else that wants to add something or, or wasn't planning on saying something right now, but here's something in the discussion and wants to participate. Um, we'll do that, and we're aiming to try to wrap up eight-ish, but there's no, I don't think that Dennis Dickinson, Dennis, thank you and Colleague George for hosting our forum tonight. Um, I don't think we're going to get kicked out much past, uh, you know, you know, at rate at eight sharp, but, you know, we're going to try to keep it, uh, you know, productive and efficient, and, um, but, you know, we're, we're, we'll try to hear everybody that wants to be heard as well, so, you know, uh, we'll, 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 we'll play it by ear, and I do appreciate there's some people, including our first, uh, person I would like to testify that, that came from a fair amount of way, uh, Davina Weinmiller from uh, the town of St. Arm. Uh, Davina, if you want to come up and, uh, and share with us, and I, I did, as uh, she's making her way up here, I, I toured uh, with her a few weeks ago, um, her uh, her wastewater plant, and she's got some concerns with DEC and, and uh, the changing regulations and, and whatnot. I don't know if that's what she wants to talk about, but Davina, thanks for, in public, thank you for taking me around the other day, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's so great to see everyone here. We have very big issues in the North Country with infrastructure, and I'm sure that's the same in your towns as it is in our towns. And one thing that I want to discuss with you tonight, and this is so critical and so crucial, and I know I'm not speaking just for myself, but from other towns in Essex County, Franklin County, the need is great for infrastructure grants for wastewater, specifically. Water as well. But in the town of St. Armand, which is a very small town, it's 52 square miles, it's uh, the northernmost town in Essex County. It encompasses the village of Bloomingdale, uh, part of the village of Saranac Lake, and also Echo Bay and Lake Placid. So we're, we're a small town, a bedroom community, um, and the folks that work and live in St. Armand and in Bloomingdale specifically, where the hamlet is, is where we have our wastewater treatment plant. We have exactly 307 units for, for wastewater. We have 368 for water. So it's a very small pool of individuals. And as most everyone know, and I'm absolutely positive, all town supervisors know, Water and sewer is 100% user funded. It is not a tax base. It's based on usage and debt service. So the debt service pays for any loans, bans, bonds, etc. The biggest problem that I'm faced with right now is in 2013, the DEC required the town of St. Armand to create a new wastewater treatment plant. So it was a $5.4 million dollar plant, 307, okay? Keep that number in mind, please, 307 users. Um, <coughs> we were awarded a $2.79 million, 0% 30-year loan from EFC, which was fantastic, so grateful. However, it's 52% of the project's cost. I did say 307, right? Okay, so now, on top of this new wastewater treatment plant that we have, our infrastructure is old, and most of it was designed in 1930, so there's massive upgrades that need to, to be done. 
The soils in St. Armand have a very high clay content, so they don't perk well. That's why, you know, in 1930, nobody in the North Country was doing wastewater treatment. You know, we, we were forced to, we had to. And this was before my time, but this has been decades in the making. It's landed in my lap, and I'm going to do everything I can for the people of my town to keep the rates low for them. Moving forward, we need approximately $12 million in infrastructure upgrades. Now, you guys deal with millions and billions, and I know everybody, that's nothing to some of you. I did mention 307 users, right? So, so 25% of a grant for 12, that's $4 million. You know, it, it's just out of reach for our people. Absolutely out of reach. And a lot of big things are happening in Lake Placid right now, which is a neighbor of ours. Um, another big problem is housing, you know? So affordable housing for people that work in Lake Placid, work at Whiteface, you know, these are all the people that live in my town. So it's just so critical that we are awarded grants to help us move forward and then focus on asset management because this is a problem that I don't want to send down the road to our kids. You know, if, if this had been done in the 60s and 70s, I wouldn't even be here talking to you. I'd have my problem solved, you know, if we were just saving a little bit at a time. And we are doing that now using capital reserve funds to help meet those matching grants. But it, it really is a lot for 307 users. We need to add more users to the system. But the DEC regulations, our plant went online in 2017. Less than a year later, we were on order on consent for disinfection. So this is a brand new plant with less than 12 months. And now we already have a disinfection order on consent. I was just informed a few months ago, and I'm sure a lot of supervisors that are here tonight, there's a phosphorus and ammonia reduction coming down the line. Absolutely 100%, we want to preserve our environment. Lake Champlain is our watershed. We have algae blooms there, and it's a problem. But the cost of those chemicals to reduce the phosphorus is tremendous. I mean, you're talking about $20,000 a year on top of the 247,000 just to run our, our plant. So, you know, it's just, it's way too much. Other things can be done to reduce phosphorus in Lake Champlain. Um, I believe that, you know, wastewater treatment to focus on that, it's easy because it's already being measured, you know, but there are other things that can be done on the Vermont side, on the um, Canada side. So it's a federal waterway. So we need federal money to help us too. So thank you so much. I truly, truly appreciate it. And I really hope that you think of me when you're talking and making new laws and coming up with plans and ways to help our smaller communities that are really the backbone of New York. Thank you, Supervisor. Any questions for the Supervisor? Yes, What is Vermont? Well, I, I'm not sure what they're doing with Vermont. I know one of the big problems with um, the phosphorus issue on the Vermont side is cows. You know, there's a lot of dairy farms. And I was actually doing some research earlier today. And a dairy farm with 200 cows with a stream running through it discharges more phosphorus than a wastewater treatment plant for 6,000 people. So, I mean, that's you know, substantial. So, I mean, maybe, maybe the idea is the, you know, the runoff streams, the ones that finger into Lake Champlain, maybe there's some kind of treatment right there on, you know, smaller treatment on site there. Um, you know, there's, I'm sure there's lots of ideas and new technology that can help with this, um, but it's just, you know, the funds, the, the money, and, and. We heard that in Herkimer last week. Mm -hmm. Know, the, the need for grant funding. There was uh, 42 was the size of that that uh, supervisor's water uh, number of customers. 42. 42. Um, you know, I mean, it's it goes tough. quickly. You know, when you're talking about a million dollars, divide amongst 42 people. Right. So you know, and I was thinking of your problem, and he was describing that problem, and and we were hearing some commonalities there, and so I think we've heard you know in our own district. So. 
Absolutely, in, in the Essex County Board of Supervisors, a lot of supervisors, we all talk and we all are facing these same issues, um, you know, with the DEC making changes, which, you know, I absolutely 100% respect the DEC. You know, their job is to protect, protect our environment. God bless them, thank you. Help us do it. That's all I ask. You know, we're, we're willing to do it, but we can't do it on the backs of, you know, 307 people or, you know, the town of Willsboro or Essex, you know. Um, and it's because of the Lake Champlain, the algae, algae blooms in Lake Champlain, the phosphorus issue, that's why they're doing this. But they, we aren't hearing anything about Vermont and Montreal and the St. Lawrence Seaway, and we don't need to talk about what goes on up there. It's really not good. So, you know, when, it, that, when I think about that, the 3.4 milliliters of phosphorus that St. Armand's putting out there, uh, you know, it's not too bad, you know, but mm -hmm. they want one. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Our next, uh, Walt Lender, the executive director of the Lake George Association and a resident of the town of Ticonderoga. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for coming here to Lake George to hear about our water quality concerns. Um, here in New York's North Country, where we are blessed to be surrounded by thousands of lakes containing billions and billions of gallons of clean, clear, fresh water. Those of us who live and work here have learned how to conserve and protect these freshwater resources. We use them every day for drinking, swimming, fishing, and boating. But increasing pressure from development Climate change, invasive species, and other factors are causing water quality to, to decline. We must do everything we can to stop that and reverse it by improving wastewater treatment infrastructure, better managing stormwater, and preventing the spread of invasive species. At the Lake George Association, we have been conserving the waters of Lake George for 135 years. We're the oldest lake association in the country. These waters have been historically used for transportation, commerce, recreation, water power, and most importantly, as the primary source for drinking water for thousands of residents and visitors. Through our century-long efforts, and more, recent, more recently the efforts of many other groups, we have kept Lake George remarkably clean, but we cannot let down our guard. We must use all the resources that we can muster to put stronger and stronger water quality protections in place. The updated watershed-wide stormwater management regulations that are proposed by the Lake George Park Commission will be a key tool once those are approved. Our efforts over the last decades with municipalities and homeowners to reduce stormwater have resulted in great success. Working together with the state's Department of State, Department of Transportation, DEC, the Soil and Water Conservation Districts, Highway Departments, the Regional Planning Board, homeowner associations, and many not-for-profits such as the Lake George Land Conservancy and the Fund for Lake George, we have made great strides, but we can all do more and we can do better. The list of needs is long. I have a document here that was compiled by Quickney, the Champlain Watershed Improvement Coalition of New York, and many of the other stakeholder groups that outlines about $187 million worth of potential projects that could improve um, water quality in the region. We know, that we know what we have to do, and we must invest in wastewater treatment infrastructure, improved stormwater management, and invasive species spread prevention. At the LGA, we are doing our part by raising funds from private sources and leveraging public funds through grants, but we are a small not-for-profit organization, and we cannot do it alone. That's why we work with so many dedicated and passionate partners to protect our water resources, and we will continue our efforts for the next generations. Additional public investment from New York State and federal programs are critical, and we will support any efforts that this task force brings to increase New York State's um, investment in clean water to the North Country and statewide. Thank you very much, and I'll leave these documents with you for your committee. Thanks, Walt. Any questions for Mr. Lander? Well, uh, you spoke about in the beginning better managing stormwater. Can do you have any recommendations or? options or your expertise about how to better manage? Sure. We've been working on stormwater issues for quite a few years, and what we find is, and working with uh, local municipalities is putting stormwater into the ground as close to its source before it reaches a water body like a stream or a lake uh, is the best, uh, the best way to manage that. Uh, and having less impervious surface, 
uh, having better stormwater management regulations uh, that allow for less uh, impervious surface and less stormwater to run off properties, all those improve the way stormwater is managed and, and keep uh, those the pollutants that are carried by stormwater from entering the water bodies. So you're speaking primarily of recharge, then, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Walt. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Wallace Arnold, who's the facility manager for Brownsville, Johnstown Wastewater Treatment Facility. I didn't see him come in. I think he was, he was, he was at last week's, too. All right. Um, Thomas O'Connor, Vice President of Governor, uh, Government Relations at the Capital Region Chamber. I know he's here. Good evening, Thomas. Good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, testify. Um, as you said, I'm Tom O'Connor. I'm Vice President of the Capital Region Chamber, uh, the largest chamber within this great region. Uh, we represent 2,500 uh, businesses, employers throughout the region. Uh, those employers are located within the region, also outside the region's border, as well as nationally and internationally. Uh, large companies to small companies, school districts, towns and villages throughout the region. Um, one of the things that's very important to the business community when we're looking to grow our businesses, retain our businesses, attract new businesses to this region, it comes down to not only the workforce, but also infrastructure, whether it's access to energy, uh, broadband, our surface infrastructure, and importantly, our water and sewer infrastructure. All of those elements drives a successful business and continues a strong economy. So when you look at our region, so much of our below surface infrastructure, sewer and water, a lot of that is 100 years old or more. And when you look at investment, our localities, our local taxpayers cannot absorb the burden of addressing the high need of replacing that infrastructure. It really takes an effort by the state and the federal government to really commit to reliable investment so that our localities can address this serious issue. Uh, there's probably not many times that pass within this region where you don't have some failure of our water sewer infrastructure. And when those systems fail, you literally shut down Main Street. Businesses can't operate. So I would encourage you to take a look at legislation pending right now in the state legislature. It's the uh, Safe Water Infrastructure Action Program. That basically would mirror what you have for local street and highway investment, CHIPS. So this would be SWAP. And what that would do would allow the state to provide funding to local governments to really invest and maintain this important infrastructure. Um, we think that would go a long way to solving the problem without putting additional burdens on our local governments and our taxpayers. The other item I think uh, you should focus on is we represent a lot of marine-related businesses throughout the region. So whether it's uh, fighting invasives or making sure our canals are at a depth that they're usable, uh, a whole host. The, that is an important part of our economy. Uh, you really can't go anywhere in this region without being that far from a great body of water, whether it's a lake or a river. Those businesses rely on all of us ensuring that we're fighting invasives, that we're making sure we're investing in keeping our canals wide enough so they're passable. Um, it's important to this economy. Uh, so with that said, I take any questions.
for uh, to throw it to the panel for questions. I just want to follow up on SWAP. <clears throat> Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, and we talked to, briefly about that um, at our Herkimer uh, uh, event last week. And um, the, you know, the history on that, Tom, I'm sure you know, because it, it came locally, it was um, Senator, well then it was Assemblyman Tedesco. Uh, it was his bill that came out of our conference. Now he's in the Senate, he is carrying the bill in the Senate, and um, the bill is actually being carried by the other stack in the Assembly now. And I'm, uh, I'm he spells it incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but I'm a co-sponsor on, on that legislation and uh, for everyone else's benefit, because I know this has gotten a little bit of attention, so I think a lot of supervisors are familiar, but it mirrors or it would attempt to replicate what is largely viewed as a very fair distribution formula in CHIPS. Mm -hmm. uh, CHIPS, uh, Consolidated Highway, the local uh, road funding, you know, at least there's no politics, there's no gnashing of teeth, there's no annual debate over who gets what percentage. That's established in how many miles of road you have. I mean, you know, so it's something that's mm -hmm. measurable and it's it's understandable and it's 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 not political. And um, and so really, the debate every year with chips is just how much to fund it. And uh, it's what SWAP would do for water and wastewater infrastructure is say, hey, how many miles of pipe do you have? What's the diameter of that pipe? So something analogous to a road system, um, which I think is a good metaphor. Um, and, uh, and it would require that the state uh, fund that to the same level as CHIPS, which is in the neighborhood of $400 million right now. And they, you know, for everyone's uh, benefit, you know, what does $400 million annually represent? There's some reports that are out there and the comptroller's office cites them, uh, and I, I, I haven't heard anyone challenge them, so I think these numbers have become accepted that there is a need for both water and wastewater capital investment of forty billion dollars each, forty billion water and forty billion wastewater over the next twenty years, just in New York State. Not that that all needs to come from the state, but as Supervisor Weinmiller would point out, it would not necessarily all to come from the ratepayer individuals either. Um, the plants that were built, specifically the, the wastewater plants, a few decades ago, um, you know, they were built largely with federal funding. The federal funding has dried up, and now all these plants are aging out where they need significant investment again and that's where we are so there's an 80 billion dollar need uh you know over the next 20 years so there's four billion dollars so 400 million is not a it's not an excessive amount it's probably a good to start with amount so that's the gist of that um that uh, legislation it may be the kind of thing that gets incorporated into a budget in the future but i thank you for bringing that up because it also I, I, I like to make sure that people are aware of that suggestion because I think mm -hmm. it's a fair one, but also that it gave me an opportunity to make sure that everyone knew, hey, how much money are we talking about here? We think that the need is about $80 billion statewide. Um, so I think you're correct. And I, for, for Tom, uh, I think you're correct that it, it, it does mirror the uh, transportation infrastructure need as well because uh, that uh, is sorely underfunded. Uh, at both the state and federal level. But unlike our water infrastructure, at least you have chips doing the surface. We need to get the same type of funding for below the surface. You know, I totally agree. I think, um, you know, in, in the town of Walston, where I sat on the town board for eight years, you know, uh, we have Walston Lake. And, uh, you know, I think, in, that, in our community, over the years, the, the idea of um, extending sewer was voted down, even when, when the federal government was reimbursing, I don't know, like 85 or 90 cents to the dollar, I think, on projects back, you know, years and years ago. Um, our, our residents, and that was way before my time, but uh, our residents were voting it down because they were afraid that if they approved sewer, uh, that it would, uh, destroy the rural uh, quality of the town. So in the meantime, we've got around Boston Lake camps, you know, seasonal homes. Um, we used to sit at the uh, town board members sat at the board of health. So we would have to go in periodically as um, the camp was raised and a year round home went up, you know, and that was still, Boston Lake is still used by some as drinking water. You know, the whole, uh, the whole lake, we haven't hit the point where there's a consent order or anything yet where we have to do it, but they're looking at doing sewering and the federal funding isn't there, the state funding is there to your point, supervisor, and but it doesn't nearly get all of it covered. And um, 
So yeah, it's a big problem. I mean, I think right now, I mean, now that the now that the Senate has flipped, I don't know if Senator Tedisco will continue to carry the swap bill in the Senate or whether it will go to another uh, a majority member. But um, no, I mean, I was there for the when, the when that bill was first kicked off, and I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense because. Every year, there's a huge chips rally just to get the chips funding, you know, an extreme winter recovery money, just where it was. You know, it's always being been proposed in the governor's budget to be cut, and then at the last second, it it generally will, you know, get restored or it's miracle of miracles. It's used as it should, I think, during the the uh, budgeting process. But yeah, we we can't have these. Um, well, we we refer to it as like Hunger Games sort of. Um, awards of you know winners and losers, and a lot of the winners tend to be well, unfortunate to us. Um, a lot of downstate projects. No offense, um, Mr. Country, <laughs> but you know sometimes that money doesn't make its way up here, and we have needs too. I mean, I know in the village of Walton Spa, we've mm -hmm. got we've got some you know wooden pipe that's still being used for mm -hmm. some of the uh, water system that we've got. So. So thanks for coming in and talking about the bill. We, we all have a copy of it. We're very familiar. I'm a, I'm a co-sponsor of the bill as well. Great. I, I hope it goes someplace. Great. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Sarah Ravenhall, Executive Director of the New York Association of County Health Officials. Good evening. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Would you like a copy? Sure. Yes. We'll take one. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm Sarah Ravenhall, I'm the Executive Director of the New York State Association of County Health Officials, representing the 58 local health departments across New York State. Um, first I want to thank Assembly Member Kolb, uh, Assembly Member Stack, Assembly Member LaPetri, Assembly Member Walsh, and Assembly Member Ashby, as well as the other committees on the Assembly Minority Task Force on Water Quality for inviting us to participate and holding this very important public forum. Environmental health staff of full service local health departments work hard to assure the quality of drinking water, but there are several drinking water related concerns that they believe need to be acknowledged. The first is chloride contamination in drinking water supplies due to road salt. It's an emerging problem. It can, chloride can make water salty. It can increase the potential for lead exposure due to corrosion. We recommend an increased focus on this problem by the Drinking Water Quality Council, looking into non-chloride products and analyzing current de-icing policies. It's crucial to improve processes around unregulated substances in drinking water for clarifying roles and responses to protect the public and assure a timely and coordinated response as new risks emerge, specifically the ones that recently occurred for contaminants, um, including PFOA, uh, PFOS, and 1,4-dioxane. We also support increased watershed protection, um, and we feel that increased cooperation between the New York State Department of Health and New York State Department of Environmental Conservation with regards to reducing pollution sources like stormwater runoff, wastewater treatment plants, and agricultural activities can better protect public drinking water. Funding is needed for distribution system upgrades given the multiple incidences of water main breaks and related water infrastructure problems across the state. We also emphasize the need for, for proactive education and ask the state to provide resources to increase awareness about extreme weather conditions and their impact on public water lines. We encourage better oversight of concentrated animal feeding operations, plans, sitting of manure lagoons, and implementation of regulations on non-CAFO operations, as well as the implementation of best management practices to limit agriculture-associated water contamination. In 2016, for the first time in New York State, harmful algal bloom associated cyanotoxins were detected in public drinking water systems. It's important to develop monitoring methodology to move quickly to determine the level of toxin in treated public water supplies so that officials can respond to the public's inquiries with regard to the safety of the water that they're uh, drinking or using for recreational purposes. 
In the face of these threats to our drinking water, local health departments continue to face ongoing resource limitations that undermine their capacity to respond. We ask that the legislature uh, consider policy recommendations that strengthen and facilitate par partnerships across state agencies and between those state and local entities that share primary responsibility for assuring access to safe drinking water. In the face of these threats to our drinking water, local health departments can continue to face ongoing resource limitations. Um, the 2% New York State property tax cap constraints local governmental budgets. When coupled with the stagnant state funding, the result is that local health departments too often struggle to maintain current programs, much less enhance their ability to respond to um, growing challenges and emerging issues around water quality. So our recommendation is um, for uh, additional funding in the fiscal year to protect and enhance our waters, our uh, public health infrastructure. By increasing Article 6 ba base grants and state aid to local health departments, increasing the ba beyond the base grant state aid reimbursement rate from 36 to 38 percent, providing 100 percent reimbursement for the first full year of any new or significantly expanded mandates emerging from law, rule, or regulation. Um, increasing the drinking water enhancement grant funding to local health departments and uh, the county health officials and our the association that I represent, ICHO, look forward to working with you to develop the policies and identify the resources and services necessary to protect our citizens. And all of the details of those asks are outlined within the full uh, written testimony. Thank you for the opportunity. And we will incorporate that into our materials. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just wanted some, just to clarify some, um, some questions. Sure. Might be in the written testimony. Yes, yes, and I hope I can answer these sure. questions. If not, case, I'll go back to the subject matter expert. It's okay, worst case, some of these questions, you may just say, like, please refer to the written testimony. Okay. okay. <laughs> no problem at all. But you were talking about um, oversight over animal feeding methods yes. and the lagoons. Yes. Could you elaborate on that? Um, I think uh, what I'm referring to is that in some farms, uh, there are these manure lagoons. And where they're situated in the land property, there could be runoff, and the, and the phosphorus from these lagoons are getting into water supply. And we're wondering if that has anything to do with harmful algal blooms. I hope I'm, okay. I hope I'm correct. You know but there is more detail in the written testimony. Okay. Do you know if there's been any inquiry of, of for that type of stuff? I, I'm very confident the State Department of Health and um, State Department of Environmental Conservation are looking at these um, issues, but I think there's always more room for, you know, more research, more research around these topics. And I can certainly <coughs> find out more for you as well. Okay. And what about... Uh, you spoke about the DIC policy. Yes. Uh, the, chlor the chloride contaminant from roads. Yes, off. yes. So, um, and this is a tough, tough one, I think, because the road um, safety and transportation departments have to be careful about, um, in the winter, we have snow up here and, and people are traveling and, and you have to put the, the salt down um, to make sure that the roads are de-iced. Um, but the salt seems to be getting into some of the water bodies. Um, there is a specific case in Rockland that I can get you more information on. Um, that And that uh, chlor chloride that is in the salt um, contaminated the water, water body. So I think our recommendation for that specific issue would just be to look at um, the current de-icing policies that are currently being used to protect communities and then coming up with non-chloride solutions to um, de-icing the roads. Okay. Specifically, it's just the chloride itself that's within that ice. Okay. Have you uh, at all looked into or has the association looked into the idea of uh, with porous, <coughs> porous roadways? Or I know we speak about it on the speakers beforehand, but I'm just curious if there's been any investigation from the association about porous roadways or porous asphalt mm -hmm. and the effects of icing uh, on huh. those roadways, if that would be a possibility of maybe some handling that chloride issue while at the same time handling recharge issue at the same time handling um, the, the icing of the roadways. Interesting. I'll have to look into that more for you and okay. find out if it's been um, discussed. Okay. Uh, and this is just a, a quick fact, just curious uh, if you knew if you know this as well. Do you know how many total water main breaks in New York State as a whole there have been? Uh, I do not. Um, 
Um, but I'm, I, I can find out, I, you know, I'm happy to find that out. Yeah, I'm sure one of the, our, you know, we work very closely with Department of Health and, and Environmental Conservation, so I'm sure they have those numbers. That's a great question. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Next will be Eric Sai, Executive Director of the Pump for Lake George. Perfect segue. A lot of the discussion that you just had um, uh, in Lake George is in up to their eyebrows and trying new things and solutions, including forest pavement. And we dedicated an entire day in Lake Placid not long ago to the issue of road salt. Oh my goodness. So I'm excited to be the guy to talk to right here. Okay. You're right. going to steal my thunder. So, All right. Thank you. So as mentioned, I am Eric Sai, Executive Director of the Fund for Lake George, and I just want to thank you for taking this uh, initiative on. It couldn't be more important, and I'm delighted to be here and have the opportunity to speak. I think it's critically important what you're doing, which is to establish goals on solving these problems, because it's all got to be purpose-driven. Uh, with some very clear goals on what we're going to do to solve the compounding problems that are confronting our waters. So thank you very much. And what we have learned, and certainly uh, Assemblyman Steck knows uh, quite well, is that it's been a concerted commitment across sectors, across the aisle, certainly, and across levels of government that is needed to succeed on this issue. This is complex. I mean, from road salt, I'll, I'll get into this, but all of the issues are compounding to have a profound impact on the, the, the quality of our waters and the fate of our waters for future generations. So I, I just want to get into some of these details. I actually brought along some packets of the materials I'll be referring to. Not enough for each of you, but you can share. And it's all available at our website. So fundforlakegeorge.org. Um, a bit of background for those of you who don't know us, the Fund for Lake George is a science-guided advocacy organization. We were founded in 1980, and we are dedicated to harnessing the power of science to solve the problems uh, facing certainly Lake George, but to do so in a way that is intended certainly to uh, protect Lake George, but to make Lake George a model for other water bodies. Lake George, as you know, is the queen of American lakes. It's very special, certainly to New Yorkers generally, but to the nation and even the world. Uh, people know Lake George, they love it. They're passionate about this place and we are dedicated to ensuring it stays protected for future generations. So to that end, we have actually succeeded in making Lake George, and this is a big announcement, it's just being made now, um, the world's smartest lake. And what does that mean uh, in, in practical terms? Lake George has the most sophisticated network, smart sensor network, if you will, that is measuring physical, chemical, biological properties comprehensively uh, in real time. Um, for what purpose? Not just to be the smartest lake in the world scientifically, but to apply that science in protecting Lake George, putting eyes on the problems and then on the solutions to those problems. So in your packets, we have the latest annual report of the Jefferson Project at Lake George. This is our partnership with IBM and RPI that is unlike anything being done anywhere in the world. And, and you'll hear more about it, and you'll certainly read more about the latest and the greatest in, in this uh, annual report. Um, so I, I encourage you to do that. We are literally, as the title of this report says, working to build the future of freshwater protection, as I mentioned, to make Lake George a model for uh, others to learn from. We don't have all the answers. We're not going to pretend to. They're complex issues. They require a lot of eyes on the problems, a lot of brains, and a diverse constituency to make a difference for the future. But we do have, and I, and I want to call this out, we have our own goals. And we're, we're an organization that really functions more like a business, if you will. We're goal-driven, we're, we're milestone-driven, uh, very specific hard target milestones that drive us on four fronts. And what I thought I'd do for, for your benefit, if, if you'll indulge me, is just to read our four goals for 2020. 
Eric, and the folder right now? They're, they're, it's all in. Anything I refer to? You've got to read along with you, Eric. I mean, oh, you, okay. You, you, you nice take, take these. Here, of course. Take these. I just don't want to distract you from the remarks, but here they are in a nutshell. Number one, Lake George serves as the global example to inform, sustain protection of freshwater ecosystems. I just mentioned we're now the world's smartest lake. That goal has, in essence, been achieved to a certain extent. Number two, no new invasive species enter Lake George. We have, and I'm going to go right to the progress we're making on each of these fronts, um, now the strongest, as, as I, I hope many of you know, uh, aquatic invasive prevention program east of the Mississippi. And it's a tribute to, and I see Dave Wick, executive director of the Lake George Park Commission here. Uh, the Park Commission administers this program. But it is the strongest prevention program. I forget how, I think it's 130,000 boats, Dave. How many boats have been inspected? Over the past six years, yes. 130,000 boats over the past six years have been inspected and as necessary decontaminated. That is huge. Nobody else is doing this. We all need to be doing it. We need a statewide. So I, if I could get to that, what we did to make this happen, and it's a tribute to some of our local government leaders who are in the back of the room of all places, but that's fine. They can be there. Um, we created something called the Save Lake George Partnership, Stop Aquatic Invasives from Entering Lake George. This group not only spoke with one voice, and it was largely comprised of local government officials, but we actually put our money where our mouths are to co-invest in that state-administered program, uh, dollar for dollar, and we continue to do it to this day, and we'll continue to do it for the foreseeable future, because the issue is just that important. We, we have to, this is a bullet train coming at us at the highest rate of speed, and if we don't stop invasives, they're gonna stop us. I mean that, I, I refer to them, and I'm, I'm off script here, but I'm going to say it. It's like the Bush Doctrine on terrorism. Maybe it's a bad analogy, but it's true. We've got to take, I refer to invasives as ecological terrorists, if you will. And unless we stop them at their source, we are not going to win the battle uh, on invasives and what they're doing, not just to our waters, but to our landscapes, our forests as well. Um, that's the other side of this issue that is a, a nightmare scenario. It's much harder to prevent. But getting back on track here, so those are two goals, invasives and science. But on the next goal, providing the nation's best practices model for reducing salt use. Uh, we've done that. We believe we now have the best practices example of what it takes to understand how much road salt is being applied, lane mile by lane mile, uh, parking lot by parking lot, if you will. Uh, and the amount of salt applied in the Lake George Basin when we first discovered the actual application rates, up to 30,000 metric tons every single year. In, the, in this basin alone, I mean, where is that salt going? It's going into Lake George, ultimately. It's going into our groundwater. It's going into our soils. It's having a profound effect on the, the health of the ecosystem here, and will continue to do so unless we get ahead of it, and that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, Assemblyman Steck mentioned our, our salt summit. We've had our fifth salt summit this month, earlier this month. It's become so popular that we actually held it in the town of Lake Placid. Mirror Lake has a very, very serious uh, issue with uh, road salt uh, contamination. And it was standing room only. Dan, you were there. You can attest to it. Uh, and we are working again at all levels of government to solve this problem, and I, I, I won't bore you with all the details, but you can check it out in the publications and on our website to learn more. And then finally, and, and the, the, our waterkeeper, Lake George waterkeeper, Chris Nowitzki, will be speaking to this. We have developed, conceived of, developed, implemented, and are documenting breakthrough programs on curbing the impacts of both wastewater and stormwater. Um, and it's, you know, we, we need to act fast, and that's exactly how we're proceeding. So what is, what is the prescription for protection here? What is the prescription for uh, success? It's partnership, innovation, and investment, right? That's, those, those are the three pillars of our so-called model for enduring protection of Lake George. It's, again, it's, it's in your packets. Um, the fund alone on the investment front has invested a total of over $8 million in the past several years, 
on our protection priorities across, we call them four portals, uh, the, the portals to protection, across those four issue areas, those goal areas that I, that I referred to. But more important, we have actually targeted these investments to produce a 7x multiplier effect. So for every dollar we invest in priority problems affecting Lake George, leads to an additional $7 in public and private funding to solve those problems. So I, I would encourage you to, to, uh, to focus on how we leverage the funding that we do bring to bear on these problems going forward. And I, and I have to say the effectiveness of the model that we have been working to create and document the, the results of is attracting interest from other threatened waters. And this includes the HABs initiative lakes. For those who, who don't know the program, there's a harmful algal bloom initiative uh, in New York State that was initiated in late uh, 2017 by the governor. Uh, with uh, the Department of Health, Department of Ag and Markets, and DEC. And it's focused on 12 lakes initially. Lake George is one of the 12. Lake George is the only one of the 12 that has yet to experience a toxic algal bloom. Um, but we've had visits now from three of those HABs lakes, including Chautauqua Lake, as well as Skinny Atlas Lake, We've also had, and that occurred this month, a visit from Lake Hopatcong in New Jersey, the largest freshwater body in New Jersey that experienced a very severe bloom uh, this summer. It was widely reported in the New York Times as well as the Washington Post. They came to understand what we're doing, and we spent time with leaders in the state of Florida, which is, as you know, is a war zone of both marine and freshwater blooms. So this is the, a sign of the times. Um, uh, all of these uh, water bodies are confronting the devastating, not just environmental impacts, but economic impacts of toxic blooms and, and what's behind these blooms. And also in your packets, there's a, a new article out from, uh, that's, that appears in Nature, the journal Nature, and I'll read the title, Widespread Global Increase in Intense Lake Phytoplankton Bloom Since the 1980s. And, and just one line from this uh, article, I think, says it all. Freshwater blooms result in economic losses of over $4 billion annually in the United States alone. That's a huge number. And it's a number that we've got to address and, and focus on in any, any actions we take moving forward. Um, so folks are coming to Lake George to learn our approach how we're doing what we do in partnership with public and private interests, including the Lake George Association. And I saw uh, Jamie Brown from the Lake George Land Conservancy. This is an all in, all out effort. Uh, so it's wonderful again to have you here. Um, and, I, and I'm just gonna close by referring to a, another emerging initiative that speaks to the growing needs statewide uh, and it's a product of the Harmful Algal Bloom Initiative, uh, the HABs Initiative. Um, there is now emerging the creation of a Clean Lakes collaboration. You may have heard about it, starting with HABs Lakes to speak and act with one voice on priority threats. Uh, there is an MOU that was conceived of and adopted by Chautauqua Lake. Chautauqua, one of the 12, is the worst of the 12 lakes with respect to the severity and the frequency of toxic blooms. Copies of that MOU are, are in your packets as well, but I just want to read what the intent of this new uh, strategic voice is for the Clean Lakes collaboration. This new collaboration is dedicated to solving the problems threatening water quality with particular emphasis um, on improving wastewater and stormwater controls stopping the introduction and, introduction, excuse me, and spread of aquatic and terrestrial invasive species, reducing the use of excessive road salt, and thus increasing resilience to climate change. But here's, here's the punchline, and, and, I'll, and I'll close with this. Um, the ultimate goal in everything we're doing uh, through partnership, innovation, and investment um, needs to be underwritten. We need to invest in our waters now when we need state funds not just funds through an array which can often be complex and for which many interests are really not equipped to even pursue those grant fundings. The applications are, can be very tedious, complicated, et cetera.
but we need state funds and resources dedicated to supporting implementation of measures to solve specific water quality problems. This is in the MOU. We need your help in getting, making this happen. And we look forward very, very much to working with the task force in partnership to make sure that the state can do its part on behalf of our waters for future generations. We have no time to lose. Now is the time. And we need to step up and, and do what's responsible for our children and our grandchildren. So thank you very much. Thank you. Very appreciative. Could you elaborate on the lid certification system? Uh, absolutely, that's a great that's a great question. So, lid certification, that lid stands for low impact development, and low impact development is designed to address what the EPA has referred to as the source, the biggest source, single largest source, I should say of water quality problems facing the United States. Uh, storm water is everywhere and nowhere. It's very hard to regulate for because there are so many varied sources in scale and scope. Uh, so the LID certification program is, if you know LEED certification for green buildings, yeah. LID certification is the natural complement for everything that surrounds the building envelope, if you will, and, and Chris Nowitzki, who's one of the architects of this program, can speak to it more directly. But it's designed to incentivize doing the right thing by developing with nature uh, rather than working against nature and engineering um, away from natural hydrology, you know, the natural flows, the natural infiltration mechanisms that prevent stormwater runoff in the first place. Uh, so the point, it's a point-based system just like LEED certification. Um, it has great promise in not requiring uh, uh, public policy necessarily, uh, but empowering private and public interests in becoming LEED certified. Since you've brought it up, which I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity, What's really needed to get LID moving, LID certification moving in a, in a much more uh, accelerated way is uh, incentives. We need to incentivize this program with specific tax breaks. So in other words, if you become a LID, if you qualify to become LID certified with a public or private development, and there, we have a LIDcertification.org website, and I would encourage you to look at it. Um, but if you qualify to become LID certified, you should be eligible for specific tax breaks, financial incentives that will help ensure more and more people who want to develop or redevelop, again, whether it's public or private at multiple scales, do the right thing in stopping stormwater runoff. We're not putting anyone on Mars or even the moon. <laughs> We're simply reducing stormwater runoff and all of the contaminants that go along with that runoff into our waters to, to great impact. Um. Yeah. Prefacing this task force, I did independent research. I had some meetings with individuals, typically on technology. And what's, what really struck me very interested in, in your, 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 your speech was also about the innovation concept and ingenuity. And I wanted to kind of talk to you about that. And sure. Do you see any sort of technologies available that perhaps not only local municipalities, but the state as a whole, could really focus in on in terms of going, turning to next gen uh, infrastructure. Something, yeah. we, I mean, something we've heard in Herkimer and now here, and I'm sure we're going to be hearing continuously is the, the antiquated infrastructure. Sure. Uh, 120 year old piping. Right. But it's beyond, but there comes, there comes a cost with that sure. associated. Not just simply replacing the piping, but digging up the piping stifling local economic growth, local mm -hmm. communities. And I wanted to see if you were aware of any other technologies available in which we could identify to yeah. not only protect our stormwater or wastewater or clean our wastewater, but then also our drinking water. Right. I wanted to kind of hear what your thoughts were. I know I saw some investigations into infrared technology to identify right. pointed uh, infrastructure that was weak mm -hmm. in the system. But right. have you seen any other technologies available? Sure. Well, you know, I would pose this question to Chris Nowitzki as well when he speaks. 
But I will point out one great example, and we just had a delegation up from the Department of Environmental Conservation, the Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Water, Jim Tierney, and his crew, including uh, staff from Long Island, which is, you know, it's kind of ground zero for yeah. septic-related problems and toxic blooms and so forth. Um, not to steal Chris's thunder, but one of the things, uh, one of our targeted investments was in a wood chip bioreactor uh, to the town of Bolton. So we worked in partnership with the town of Bolton and, and Supervisor Conover, that's why I'm looking back there, Supervisor Conover uh, really led the effort uh, and, and demonstrated bold leadership to support the concept for uh, building a wood chip bioreactor. This is very low cost, uh, but highly effective technology for removing nitrates from wastewater, right? Chris can speak to this in detail. It's been documented extensively by the town and by the waterkeeper. But the performance, we did this a year ago. We, we, we granted the town $50,000, which was the price tag for the wood chip bioreactor. And the, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but the reduction in nitrates in this past year alone, and nitrates are increasingly, just to preface it, seen as uh, a major contributor to harmful algal blooms. It was previously thought that it's primarily phosphorus uh, loading that's the problem, but nitrates are perhaps as big a factor. And so reducing nitrates as they flow into the lake is a, is a huge concern and a simple, effective technology like a, the, and it's literally wood chips, usually hardwood uh, chips, that um, are having a, an enormous uh, benefit to getting nitrates out of wastewater before it uh, makes its way into the groundwater and ultimately into Lake George. I mean, it's one great example. Um, and we couldn't be more pleased. And I think DEC and, and the team that was here last week, they were, they were really, I mean, I'm not going to put words in their mouth, but they couldn't help but be impressed. And it's the first ever, one reason it's an innovation, it's been done in other places, but it's the first ever municipal application of this technology. So for a municipal treatment system um, to remove nitrates from the waste stream before it does its dirty work in our waterways. Thank you. And while he's getting settled, I just want to point out, and we just heard from the fund and, and uh, the waterkeeper here with the fund, uh, the Lake George Association um, spoke earlier, and then the, the third uh, um, partner, uh, environmental partner on the lake, uh, and also here, I don't know if we'll hear from Jamie Brown, but the Lake George Land Conservancy. There's three uh, uh, of the larger and older and, um, and, and uh, very active uh, environmental groups that are centered around Lake George that have worked exceptionally well together. Um, and uh, from a local government perspective, perhaps more importantly for all the supervisors in the room, working very closely with local government on a lot of these issues. Um, in Lake George, uh, the, he mentioned um, the Queen of American Lakes. That's a, a, a reference to a, a letter that um, Thomas Jefferson wrote to his daughter when he saw Lake George, he says, this is undoubtedly the most beautiful body of water I've ever seen. He, he dubbed it the Queen of American Lakes. And the project, uh, the Jefferson Project, is uh, the uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, or Rensselaer RPI, um, in conjunction with IBM. Uh, a lot of technology and a lot of work uh, by a lot of really, really, really super smart PhDs have uh, put, been poured into um, Lake George in the last, Eric, five years? Five years, about right? Yes. Um, so, I mean, when they say it's the smartest lake in the world, I mean, there are sensors all over all the inlets to the lake. There's, uh, you know, vertical column uh, water samplers that are, you know, getting data on everything. They're getting data faster on Lake George, uh, you know, now in like a year than they did the previous hundred years uh, that, you know, that was done. So it's, um, it, and it's getting a, a model, computer model. I mean, just the, uh, I've seen the models and the, what's being done in Lake George is, you know, and awesome for Lake George, but as Eric alluded to, there's going to be lessons learned and applications that will be derived from the work on Lake George that are going to benefit other bodies of water. And I know there's there's other bodies of water in other countries that are already 
using some of the knowledge that's come from this. So we're proud to be here in the Lake George region. I apologize for taking your time because just about everyone in the audience is familiar with Jefferson Project. But yeah, and I, I'm sure Jake and Mary Beth are, but for our guy from Long Island, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to catch him up a little bit. So. Yeah, I think it's very, it's, I think it's very interesting, the whole concept of sensors, and sensors are finding their way, that technology in so many different aspects of our lives. And when I think about like the little, the small lake that's in my hometown, you know, we have um, uh, Boston Lake Improvement Association that uh, they have volunteers that go out and just periodically just collect files and then send them out for testing. And it's that, it's that old school, the concept that you can have real time data that's coming in through the sensors, I just think is, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, here on Lake George. You do that as well. The Lake George Association does that. Yeah. We, we don't have access to the Jefferson Project's data, so we go collect our own. So you still do it that yeah. the other end. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Mr. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I can see my testimony just getting whittled away, but I still have the same amount of time, right? Of course. The Yankees are out. We're here all the time. Well, I thank you for this ability to, uh, to speak this evening and appreciate the interest by the task force on water quality. And I would like to recognize our assemblyman, Dan Steck, for his involvement. We've worked with him for many years and appreciate this. Um, I think you know by now, my name's Chris Nowitzki and I'm the Lake George Waterkeeper, which is a program of the Fund for Lake George. And I've been applying scientific research and engineering principles to protect Lake George for 18 years. The focus of your task force is critical for the vitality of our communities and for the quality of our life, especially in this time of increasing concern and occurrences of harmful algal blooms. Although we are fortunate not to have experienced a HAB on Lake George, as our partners with the Jefferson Project, as well as our monitoring with the fund, we've documented increased algae growth throughout the lake. And more troubling is actually the specific species that are identified as being associated with organic pollution attributed to wastewater sources and increased levels of nutrients. We, we've heard about the issues, uh, but my, my comments are going to really focus on inadequate wastewater treatment, both on the municipal and private systems, and what we at the fund have done to address this. On municipal treatment, our studies of the watershed surrounding the village of Lake George, wastewater treatment plant, and the town of Boltons has really catalyzed the work and prompted action by documenting the amount of nutrients, nitrates, and phosphorus entering the lake. And as been previously mentioned, to help the town of Bolton, we provided the, the grant funding for the wood chip bioreactor and pleased about the incredible results that that has had on nitrate, nitrate reduction. On private septic systems, the results of our studies are alarming on the status of these systems and really that is essential for the protection of public health and our waters. Our studies around the lake have shown nearly two-thirds of the systems evaluated either exceed a typical life expectancy of 40 years or are un unknown. They don't even know what exists. More than 50% of the systems are not being adequately maintained with routine pump outs, which will lead to premature failure. One in five septic systems are undersized for their current use. These are all justifications for a maintenance and inspection program. Again, the fund has catalyzed solutions. Through a matching grant program started in Dunham's Bay in the town of Queensbury, nearly 20% of the systems in that North Queensbury management district have been upgraded or replaced. And we are starting a similar program with the town of Lake George. In the town of Lake George, the fund has helped identify areas of system management through a development of a prioritization algorithm where we took data sets of site suitability, evaluation of existing systems, and water quality algae biomonitoring and created an algorithm to point out and identify these areas. And our algae biomonitoring program to identify areas of concerns was recognized with an award from the New York Water Environment Association this year. But more help is needed and your task force can assist. Funding through the Clean Water Infrastructure Act must be increased for septic system replacement, and the ability for counties to participate must be expedited. 
It is my understanding Warren County has been awaiting a response on their application for over six months, and this must change. A statewide property transfer law should be implemented. I'm still amazed, and before I was a waterkeeper, I worked in um, private consulting as a professional engineer. I'm still amazed how much interest there is on home inspections and reports for financing, but minimal attention on septic systems. Seems people are more concerned about outlets and ground fault outlets than they are about septic systems. And I think, you know, the state of uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts has a statewide property transfer law. We need to do that in New York State. And there could be a pilot, a payment in lieu, a payment in lieu of taxes credit program on state income tax for homeowners for home improvements through investing in replacing their septic systems. Um, your interest, and I, I appreciate that, Assemblyman, on the lid certification, there's actually a form um, where you can get tax credits for lead certified buildings. And there's language in there that I think can be improved that would allow and become a mechanism. It's, it's form 470 with um, the state income tax form. But that could actually be allowed to provide these tax incentives and credits for properties to become lid certified. And we're looking into that and want to have discussions with the um, with real property tax and with the income tax folks. So I think that that would be very vital as well to take a look at that form and expand that language. So again, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate your initiative to take leadership on this and look forward to working with you on, on this initiative. So. Chris, thanks so much. And um, I, I could have asked this question certainly of, of Walt or Eric, but um, I'll ask you uh, um, from your perspective. It's probably because it's harder. And, no, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, um, from both uh, in your role on behalf of the waterkeeper and, and your work with the fund, or just your own observations um, with other municipalities or even uh, other organizations. Do you have a comment on um, the level of difficulty or the uh, cumbersome of the grant process in New York? Is, are there is it is it working well? Is it work is it is it is it working smooth? Or how much time does an average grant take you? Is it could it be more efficient or could, are there any obvious changes or improvements that you could? Provide? Well, it it's a cumbersome process. I mean, it it is really um, the the pages that you go through. Um, we've actually started providing grants to towns to help them get grant writers to help them go through the process. So it's, it's very onerous, it's, it's very, you know, and it's, it should be competitive, but I think, you know, there are good programs such as this infrastructure program. I think that there are ways that we can, you know, really expedite, you know, taking a look at, at these incentive programs um, through property tax where people can can take the initiative on their own and invest and get credit for that um, on the on the larger townwide projects on the larger municipal um, infrastructure needs um, you know we, we've got to really focus on you know showing the the economic benefits and, and that is part of the process but I think you know how our communities really rely on that and how that in the long term is going to benefit. Um, the, the reference earlier about the CHIPS program applying to, you know, the, the subsurface infrastructure is, is a great example of that. So I, but getting back, yes, the grant program is very onerous, very difficult. Um, and I think that it, you know, it, it was almost made so big to cover so much, and I think maybe that needs to be streamlined a bit more to reduce that effort. Yeah, I, I actually do. Um, you had mentioned earlier about the, a statewide property transfer law. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to kind of dig into that a little bit. So sure. do you mean that um, because the septic system inspection is an optional addendum to a real estate contract rather than being mandatory? Or? That's, that's correct. Okay. I mean, a lot of times, and as our, I don't mean to, to jump ahead of you, no. but as our research showed, I mean, there are 
many systems that are well over 40 years old. You spoke earlier about the old camps and cottages getting raised and replaced. And, you know, many times these people do not know where their systems are. They were set in, you know, 40, 50 years ago as, as who knows what, a, a pile of rocks sometimes to, to run gray water in for maybe a couple of months a year. Um, but, you know, that has changed. So, yeah, uh, when properties get transferred, and as I said, in the past, I, I'd done home inspections, and, and they are more concerned about ground fault outlets and septic systems. So we really need to step that up and have a statewide transfer to be done at, at the time of detransfer, and not just, you know, there, there's always ways to get around that, and it really should be on a detransfer, because when camps get handed down, a lot of times they, they stay in the family, um, but, and those are ways to get around. So I, I think that that's something that really should be looked at. State of, as I said, many other states, but Massachusetts comes right to my mind and they're right next door. And, we'll, and we can take a look and see what they're doing in Massachusetts on that for sure. Um, that sometimes we get our best ideas just to see what other states are maybe doing it better and just kind of, yeah, borrowing from them. But it seems like a few years ago, and I don't I haven't done, I, I really don't do any closings anymore. Um, but it seemed like we, we passed uh, the rules about the property uh, condition disclosure statement. And it, I, I remember it's kind of a big, long statement that the, um, the potential seller, you know, fills out. But I, don't, I, I have to go back and check and see. I think you have to fill it out, but there, you could, I don't know is a perfectly okay answer on that form. So you just say what you know. So if you don't know where your septic is, or you don't know what the condition is, or when the last time it was pumped out or anything, you can just fill it out that way the best way you can. And that's probably not adequate to address the kind of concerns that you're raising. Exactly, and if you look at the requirements for home inspectors to be certified, a lot of times the requirements on plumbing and whatnot are waived by the New York State law you know, on the building code, so they don't have to comment on it. And, and it is difficult if it's underground, it's very difficult to find out, so people are not gonna comment on it. And that's the time that we really need to address that. And I think the town of Queensbury, uh, Mr. Steck's you know, hometown actually passed the first transfer law and the town of Bolton has passed recently and I think they've, they've had a neighborhood of 35 inspections over this first year that they've had it. And I think only a handful have really gone through without any problems. Um, probably about 20% were failures, but in the middle, there's a lot of things that needed improvement on those systems. So, I mean, clearly the majority of systems need attention and, and upgrading. I have a question just with uh, Chris, you're talking about the Clean Water Infrastructure Act. Mm -hmm. You were speaking about funding that was available for wastewater replacement, was it? Ooh, septic system. Septic system. Placement, septic yes. system replacement. You said it has to be increased, but increased to what? What's your recommendation? Well, I think initially it was around $75 million, and that was over a five year period. Um, you know, I, I feel that that would at least need to be, to be doubled. 150. Yeah. Based on, based on what? Just your, just well, well, I mean, the numbers that we are seeing, I mean, you're almost saying about one out of two septic systems are outdated, are not being maintained, and, you, you know. Have that data? Uh, we have it on a smaller scale for towns, and I'd be glad to provide that report to you. Okay. For a detailed report we did for the town of Lake George, where we investigated over 400 systems and those were the numbers and for the town of Queensbury where we worked with them to implement a much smaller district there was about 75 residents the numbers were pretty identical so I would think that as you scale that up I, I think they would be about the same if, if we could get yeah so I'd be glad to like provide that yep. Longer, yep but that would be handy yeah, yes yeah, I will provide that. Program. It's on our website, but we'll make sure that a copy gets to the task force. Please, thank yep. you. Yep. I was wondering if you could speak to the uh, efficacy and the capacity and maybe other municipal uh, municipalities that are interested in the biochip reactors. 
Well, the biochip reactor, I think, is, is very, you know, it's, it's a simplistic, you know, you, it, and it, as with everything, it depends on the system and your grades, your elevations, your site, whether you need pumping and how much infrastructure adjustments you would need. But it's a flow through. It can work via gravity if you can get to that system. And, and it's very passive. I mean, you allow the, the water, and there's always engineering in all these systems, um, but you allow the water to pass through and become basically anoxic. And you allow the bacteria to take care of that. And um, I mean, the numbers we've, that the town of Bolton was getting were approaching 70% removal of nitrates. And I mean, that's, that's on average. They had higher. You know, it's also temperature dependent. So as we get into the colder times of year, you know, the water temperature decreases and the efficiency decreases. And these are some of the things that we need to find out. And that's why it's a pilot project. So I think it's very important. I think one thing that can be restrictive on that would be the size and the flows of these municipal plants. Bolton is a rather small plant flow-wise uh, with 300,000 gallons per day, where you compare to much larger systems. Um, so that bioreactor, it, it, it goes by a length and width ratio. So it's about 20 feet wide, 100 feet long, and that's about a 5 to 1 ratio you need. So it can take up a little bit of real estate. Um, so that's another thing that you would need to take a look at at larger municipal operations. For, but for a lot of these small rural systems that have antiquated treatment that was designed in the 50s and 60s with trickling filters, this is a great retrofit because they did not have that nitrification, denitrification process in that plant. So this can really be a cheaper sustainable technology to, to retrofit these systems. Do you know of any other municipalities that have expressed interest? Um, uh, none that have expressed, well, we've actually, this is the first, to our knowledge, municipal application in the country, maybe worldwide. It, was, it basically was something that came out of agriculture runoff from uh, Iowa. So, uh, but there's interest. Uh, we've gotten a grant from the Lake Champlain Sea Grant to do a two-year study on this. Um, we've been asked by the Lake Champlain Basin Program to provide a, a presentation. So it's really upcoming. Um, and, you know, this is a pilot project. So we, we really wanted to see if it worked and get, you know, authorization from the town of Bolton to talk about it. So. I hope the supervisor is okay with us <laughs> talking about it. <laughs> but, but, it, but after the meeting last week with, with the deputy commissioner of, of the Vision of Water, I mean, they were, they were very pleased with it. So. While you were answering that question, Supervisor Weinberger from St. Armand said that they're, St. Armand's interested in okay. how we're taking a look at it. So that's great. That's good. Yeah. Thank, you. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Um, We've got two more people that indicated they wanted uh, in advance that they wanted to speak, but we'll, we'll keep going. Um, the next person is Kathy Flack Monsell, who is the uh, CEO of Fort William Henry. And Fort William Henry is uh, famous from uh, history, certainly, and uh, Daniel Day Lewis. And, Last of the Mohegans. Last of the Mohegans, uh, James Fillmore Cooper, which is one of my two favorite books. So now you know that too. Thank you. I'm <laughs> a little personal. Now. That's why I wanted to come here. Well, many people think it's just the revolution that started our democracy, but it's the French and Indian War. There you go. Thank you for having me, and thank you uh, all for pulling us together here. You spoke of uh, Lake George being a water source, and it, it is, it's so much more, but it, that's really important. It's our health. I live here. I grew up here. Uh, it's our health. Uh, it feeds our health. It supports our health. It supports our economy, the CEO of Fort William Henry. But you know what, it also supports the spirit of our area and many, many others. I mean, New York City, the demographic of our guests that come up here, the millions of people that come here, uh, 90 miles around New York City. So we support a lot of the whole state. Um, I grew up in Lake George, as I said. The lake's in my blood, it's in my livelihood. Fort William Henry has been around, there's been a hotel on our property since about 1860. And we, um, our corporation was in existence since 1952. And I will tell you the hotel business is not for the faint of heart. 
So being in business since 1952 is a pretty good thing up here in the upstate New York. Um, we know that we're the stewards of one of the most beautiful properties on the lake, as well as be living in one of the most beautiful places in the world. And it, the lake is directly dependent on our existence. So I, I appreciate you calling this together to, to listen, to really listen. Um, I personally, as a CEO of Fort William Henry, have joined a board that the Fund for Lake George created called the Business Council of Advisors. And I see Patricia Dow here. I'm not sure who else is here from our group, but you know we're dedicated local small business people that want to make a difference. You know, face it, nobody wakes up in the morning and, as a business person says, you know what, I think I'll pollute the lake today. And oftentimes, uh, we need science. And, and so the science is out there now. You're looking at an extraordinarily dedicated group of, of associations and organizations and that have brought science to the table. We have to listen. It's real. Science is real. You might hear me be passionate in my emotional presentation here, but it's the science that's going to make this happen. And your listening is critical to that. So. Um, I, I guess I would ask you to consider three things, and that is keep listening. Um, I would actually ask you to ask small businesses to participate at some level, and many of us will do that. Um, and that level is when you're creating regulations and laws and, and the things that affect our businesses. Um, ask us to help you to not have unintended consequences. And understand that it's not the environment against business. It is the environment with business and business with the environment. So, so keep listening and, and ask us to participate because we will do it. Um, second point I would say is, um, is to pay attention to the, again, the science-based groups. And you see them here. You, say, you see Dave, Walt, Chris, Eric. Um, they are our science department. We really depend on them. And uh, one example is uh, our corporation, in particular, as part of the, the uh, board of advisors, we are uh, doing what we can to reduce our salt. And, and they're using the science to help us to do that, and we're investing in it because that investment makes a big difference in the long run. So I would ask you to really listen to them and take the science and take action on the science. And, and uh, last, it requires money. So when Ron and John and Matt and D Dennis come to you, they are extraordinarily educated and supportive and understanding what we need in this area. Um, please listen to them and please allocate reasonable funds that they actually can get to and, and make happen. Thank you very much. Any questions? Well said, and thank, thank you for sticking up for thank our local town supervisor. I share your opinion. Thank Take you. Care. Okay, and then, um, and I apologize if I mispronounce the name, uh, Liddell Dutramont? Dutramont? Yes, I'm sorry. Did I do all right? Not like it's spelled. Uh, thank you for taking thank the time you. to listen to me. Would you like? Oh, I just have to have Yeah, sure. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. I know we're connected on the internet. Uh, yeah, but I, well, I appreciated the invite. Yes, I, first time I've ever been any place like this. Right. Well, you know, you're lucky because so, like, everyone very here interesting. is the nicest people in the world. Seems that way. So it's a friendly crowd. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. So I'm a resident of Glens Falls, and I'm I'm a concerned citizen. I've been in contact with assembly member um, Stuck about well to try to get some attention to some issues of concern to me as a citizen and also as a mother, of, sure. you know, and also as a registered nurse. I work in healthcare, I'm a registered nurse. So just from a health perspective, the topic I'm gonna to speak on has already been mentioned tonight, um, um, PFOA, emerging contaminants, in a, yep. the larger context of emerging contaminants in the water supply. I have a particular bill that I'm advocating for. I think it would be a nice little step in the right direction uh, from the perspective <coughs> of public information, public confidence in the water supply in the face of the issue of emerging contaminants, which has become a much more, um, I'd say emerging contaminants have been in the press much more often recently. There's been a lot of investigative journalism that's come out. It's really highlighted that this is a worldwide and national and also a local issue. So to speak to that, so there's a particular bill, it's um, Assembly Bill 7625, I would hope you might consider supporting 
It was proposed by um, Assembly Member Steve Engelbright of District 4 on Long Island. He is also the chair of the Committee on Environmental Convers Conservation. Very good Assembly Member. Oh, good yes. And it seems like he has proposed a very good bill in this instance. I'm, um, he's a co-sponsored. He's out on Long Island. I'm sure everyone knows that. Co-sponsored by um, the other <laughs> uh, Assembly Member yeah, Steck, Steck, spelled the wrong way. Um, <laughs> down in District 110, which is <laughs> like Schenectady, down by Schenectady, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, he must be near you, correct? Um, next door to uh, Ashby represents who's it falls, which is certainly what brought us to our attention. So you happen to have. Oh, you do Hoosick represent Hoosick Falls? Oh my goodness, wow. So well, you're sure uh, very you familiar with this then. Um, and then also Colin Schmidt of District 99 um, has been co-sponsored the, the bill in question. We'll be with him tomorrow night as, oh, uh, wonderful. as a matter of fact for okay. another forum down his way near West Point. Okay, wonderful. Um, so it's currently um, referred to the Committee on Environmental Conservation, which you sit on, correct? Yes, so. Um, so I just, most people are probably f familiar with the PFOA contamination in Hoosick Falls, but just some background as reported by the Times Union back in 2015, in case people didn't realize how it came to light, because from the health standpoint and from, um, I guess, a regulatory standpoint, I find it very interesting how it came to light. It came to light by public action by a, an individual citizen. And uh, the particular person, Michael Hickey, his father, he grew up in Hoosick Falls, his father had passed away. And he noticed a pattern. His father passed away from um, kidney cancer. And he saw that, wow, a lot, a lot of people are coming down with cancer. This seems like a very high incidence. Young people seems wrong. And um, he um, did a little research. He started to suspect PFOA. He, on his own, went out, because this is not a chemical that's monitored in the water supplies. He went out and got it tested. And sure enough, he found from the water supply from his own faucet that um, the level was 540 uh, parts per thousand, I guess is what it is. And compare that to the current EPA guidance, not regulation, but guidance, 70. Okay, so this was the water coming out of his faucet. He had been drinking, and, and everyone in the community had been drinking. Um, more recently, as Husik Falls has highlighted, more recently it's come to light, the state um, commissioner of health is adopting this year in New York State a contaminant level of 10, 10. So compare 540 to 10, 50 times the level. And people were just, this was going unnoticed. Nobody knew until a public citizen went out and discovered this. So um, that just highlights the question of emerging contaminants. And what are emerging contaminants? Well, any unregulated contaminant that may have health risks and are suspected to be in the drinking water supplies. There are a number of other emerging contaminants of concern. Um, subsequently, you know, it's come to light. They, there have been a lot of studies that not only can it cause cancer, can cause other uh, endocrine disorders, uh, immune response disorders, um, uh, gastrointestinal diseases, you know, any number of the kind of things that I, I probably see on a daily basis on the med search unit where I work. So is there a direct link? We don't really know is the point here. And the concern is to be proactive rather than reactive. Because in our country, unfortunately, that's the way it's been with a lot of these emerging contaminants. It's kind of like they go out in the environment, people get exposed to them. Only after the fact do people like, for instance, Michael Hickey, make the connection that, oh, gee, maybe my father could have been around a little longer had we realized that these chemicals were dangerous and they were getting into our water supplies. So it's one of many. So this bill, what this bill proposes is that it would uh, modify existing New York environmental conservation law to require the Department of Environmental Conservation to promulgate a list of water contaminants for which sampling and reporting shall be required, including emerging contaminants. So the, um, it's kind of a transparency thing, a public policy, a confidence thing. Uh, it seems like a great first step. It's already out there. It's already gone to committee. I hope you would consider supporting it. Um, and that's kind of what I had to say about that. I, I would also like to add that New York Public Interest Research Group, where I did a lot of my reading in addition to the reporting that I've you know, encountered, which is rather shocking about things like PFOAs and other 
replacements that are being put out there for PFOAs now that are equally kind of not well understood, and yet they're already kind of going out into the environment, very concerning. Um, that um, the New York Public Interest Research Group has already kind of created something like this, a kind of a database that's kind of cobbled together where people can go and kind of look up what there is. But they've, they've, it's, it really seems to me the kind of thing that our state should be doing so that everybody can kind of keep track and follow along and then be able to speak up, you know, and have their concerns addressed. So um, that's, I just hope that you will take a look at this bill and maybe throw your support behind it. It looks like it already has some bipartisan support. It looks like a great bill for bipartisan support. That's what I'd like to say. Thank you. You did a great job. I'm so oh, glad thanks. we connected. This is one of those, you know, Facebook <laughs> and, hey, what about this? And I said, well, you know, we're, and you're here. So yes, thank you. Thank you. It worked out really well. Any questions for Lucas? Oh, that's wonderful. That, yeah. Uh, Mike has been helping me out with that. Oh, great. Um, that's great. Community and grateful for you being up here today and sharing this. Oh, well, my pleasure. And I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. It's very reassuring. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for you. taking your time to listen. You're Thank, you. Thank you. All right, that's everyone that had pre indicated. Mayor Hall has his hand up. Yeah. Mayor Hall. Mayor of the great city of Lens Falls, Mayor Dan Hall, alumnus of Queensbury High School. <laughs> John Strauss. As is his counterpart, John Strauss, the president of uh, Dan, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And Mayor Hall is one of the, the chief executives of one of those municipalities that has struggled with 100 year old infrastructure. The city has made great strides, chipping away at that, but I'm sure there's more to be done. Dan's been a great uh, asset in trying to get money and funding for the city. And uh, you know, well, publicly want to compliment you for all that good work that you've been doing, Dan. Well, thank you, Assemblyman. Um, that's exactly what I just handed out to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, no, and thank you for your support. Um, I'm just, I had my uh, water uh, and sewer superintendent today, uh, city engineer. We had a conversation. I asked him to put it on paper so I could, you know, read into the record. You know, the Glens Falls water and sewer system dates back to the 1860s when Glens Falls was still a village. Many of these early facilities and pipes are still in service. Our water system contains over 70 miles of pipe and over 1,200 valves with an average age of 92 years. Sizes range from two inch to 20 inch pipe. The Glens Falls water sewer system has over 60 miles of pipe dating from the 1860s, ranging in size from six inch to 40 inch, inch thick pipe. The Glens Falls water, water filtration plant was built in 2003 and is now 16 years old. We, we produce the, an average of 3.2 million gallons of water a day for our customers in compliance with New York State Department of Health standards. Our wastewater treatment plant built in 1986 serves Glens Falls, South Glens Falls, and parts of Queensbury and Monroe. An ongoing regional study is evaluating the possible expansion of the service areas to parts of Kingsbury. We currently treat an average of 3.5 million gallons a day and maintain compliance with our speedies permit. Guns Falls is currently operating a combined sewer system with an approved CSO long-term control plan. Working on this plan, we have reduced average at the wastewater treatment plant flow from 5 million gallons a day to 3.5 million gallons a day. Reduced both the volume and frequency of combined sewer overflows during storm events from over 30 million gallons to less than 5 million gallons per year. That goes along with what we were saying, Dan, some of the things that we've done. We separated a significant percentage of the sewer system, upgraded the wastewater treatment plant to maximize the percentage of stormwater flow through the plant and minimize the bypassed volume. Over the last decade, the city has taken measures to cut power consumption at our water and sewer facilities in half. These energy conservation efforts are continuing. While the city has made significant progress with both our water and sewer systems, with this work comes with a high price tag. Currently, the water and sewer departments have a combined debt load of $38 million. 
and we're only a city of 14,700. I was going to say, you're, you're much bigger than St. Armand, but yeah. these numbers are staggering, you know, certainly for a city of 14,000. Correct. Funding additional projects needed to maintain existing infrastructure or to bring into compliance with changing regulations puts financial stress on both the city and our neighboring communities. Most of the work that we have accomplished and the work that is needed can be accomplished only with the assistance of grants and subsidized financing. Challenges for the future include continuing the process of separating stormwater from sanitary sewers, finding a long-term sustainable means of biosolid disposal, upgrading the water distribution system to provide better fire flow and to improve water quality, replacing at least 500 antiquated valves to facilitate water system maintenance and repair work. Planning for the dealing with climate change, more intense rainfall, increased temperatures, and changing weather patterns. This includes monitoring water conditions and taking measures to deal with the political impact of har harmful algal blooms. Maintain our facilities for the long term to serve our existing customers and promote regional growth. So, as you know, being a city on a river, we're not alone with these, pro with these problems. It happens all across the state. Um, but, you know, we would definitely ask for support. We have gotten some support from the state, but there's never enough money. Uh, as you know, we've support for us for years. I know. It, you know, uh, we, we heard it in Herkimer, we've heard it from a town in Essex County and now a city in Warren County. Yeah. Um, I'm willing to bet we're going to hear it, you know, tomorrow night and, uh, and on Long Island. Um, but, you know, I said at Herkimer County, you know, we, we, we all, all of us, both sides of the aisle, the 150 of us in the assembly, believe we do, and I think we do, have a pretty good grip on what's going on in our own district. And then you, you usually extrapolate that and say, well, if I'm having that problem, they're probably having that problem in other similar parts of the state. Um, but it's important for us to hear that. You know, I mean, the, the, the gentleman that was talking about the 42 customers, uh, his water plant, you know, um, and the survival of their school there was in play on, on whether or not they, they you know, and I was listening to him and I was thinking St. Arnold, you know, because it was fresh in my mind that, hey, here's another <coughs> small, um, and we're, you know, we're sitting tonight in the, the town of, uh, um, of uh, Lake George's meeting room, and the uh, the mayor of Lake George, has, he runs a, a sewer treatment plant that's 86 years old. It owes, owes the community nothing. You know, they got more than their, their life's worth out of that. They're under consent order with DEC to replace it. They've broken ground. They're in the process of doing that. And even over the last couple of years of, you know, a, a tweak, a change, and, you know, and a, you know, redesign, that number has grown. And the, the last, I, you know, I can't remember right now.
it, I think it'll work, but again, we didn't have any takers that time, but uh, hopefully in the future we will. So, well, you know. I'm glad that you shared that. I mean, you, you mentioned that, and then Chris Davisky made reference to Queensbury's uh, septic mm -hmm. transfer law and, and the supervisors here, and I know that the Bolton and others are considering it. And, you know, there, it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't go without pushback and consequences and questions. You know, you are talking yeah. about, uh, you know, people's property, and, and I understand the anxieties, but. You know, your example with the lid uh, effort that you're offering as an incentive and then, you know, the local leadership, again, with um, the, uh, the septic transfer and then going back a little farther, you know, the, the environmental groups that I mentioned working with, and I'm glad I, and I neglected to say, with buy-in of the business community and the local government, I mean, there, it took a little longer. I use Lake George as an example all the time. Um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, the, the, the boat washing and the invasive species and now more recently just the, the salt effort that it, it, they, they, they took their time, they did it right, they brought everyone in, everyone became a partner, everyone was welcome, everyone participated, and you had great buy-in, um, but, the, you know, the, the local uh, municipalities have, in spite of having, you know, we talk about unfunded mandates all the time, and the state is very good at telling municipalities you will do this, and they, they groan about it, but they make it happen. But then they, they still continue to go beyond, uh, above and beyond, and offer, you know, like in your case, the, the, your, your, your live program where, the, you know, the septic or the invasive species and the salt, you know, where there's a willingness locally to do this stuff, but just the, the, the science of the math and, and where's the money going to come from. And, uh, and, and again, it's a consistent theme that we're hearing. I suspect we will continue to hear it, and it will be in our report. That, I mean, I think number one is going to come from this. It shouldn't shock anybody, but we need to, the state needs to do more of what it can uh, in the area of grants and, and, and incentives, but you know, specifically funding some of these infrastructure uh, needs that our communities have. And, and Glen Swalls is, I'm glad you came tonight, Mayor, and, uh, because I, I'd like to take the opportunity to compliment the work that you've been doing. Um, Anytime I can combine two trips into one, I, I seize that opportunity. If I could kill two birds with one stone, it makes my day better. Uh, this summer, I went to your wastewater treatment plant, not as the assemblyman, kind of scoping it out and seeing what you did, although, you know, if you want to believe that, I'm not argue with it. But with my son's Boy Scout troop, you know, they were working on a public health merit badge. And uh, one of the requirements was, you know, go toward either a water plant or wastewater plant. So we went, we went and I took the boys and a, a couple other adults and we saw that and your staff was great and they gave us a, a fair amount of the history of, you know, 1986, this is when this was built, this is where we're going. And, you know, it was very informative for these young students, uh, but it was, it was very informative for me and, and seeing it firsthand, you know, what you're doing. And then of course my office being in Glens Falls, you guys are working on the streets and roads all the time. And, I hear the stories about pulling up hundred-year-old brick pipe, and um, you know, so it's real. And uh, we appreciate you know, your work, and, and appreciate you coming. Tonight. Thank you, and you're welcome to our wastewater plant anytime. It's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't date night. I didn't bring color. I brought, I brought Peter. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, Jamie, please. And then Dennis. Or, or, Jamie Brown is the uh, executive director of the Lake George Land Conservancy, so he's that third environmental group that I made reference uh, to earlier. And Jamie, thanks for coming tonight. Thank you, Assemblyman Steck. Thank you for everyone on the committee. Um, before I start, I did want to just answer a question. Yes, grants are an issue. They are very complicated. We actually hire engineers to do our grants um, and yeah. consultants because, they, unfortunately, they're very complicated. And I'm not trying to take away money. From, we've got a couple of those. those <laughs> that is nice, but I mean, if, for a small one, I mean, for a big one, you're like, all right, you know, you're, that's expected. But if you're writing a small grant or you're a small organization and it's either, you know, you're going to spend 10 to get 20, you know, I mean, it's one thing if you're spending one to get 20, but if you're spending 10 to get 20, those, those are, are projects that are not, or they're less likely to happen. Correct. Okay, I'm sorry. No, 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 I just wanted to <laughs> uh, add that to it. So one, uh, there's been a lot of really great comments, and um, I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball at all of you. Um, one aspect of protecting water quality I don't think has been mentioned is land. Uh, so we are a land trust. We're one of 90 land trusts throughout New York State, and I think this is something that really applies throughout the state um, because land trusts are working at protecting land throughout the state. Uh, we here in Lake George, we protected about 11,000 acres 
and um, DEC has also protected about another 40,000 or so acres as well. Um, basic, and with all this, uh, the, the DEC has used uh, the Environmental Protection Fund. Uh, they get money through that, to, and that's how they purchase land, either from willing sellers or from us. Uh, it used to be we would buy land and then flip it to them. So that's worked actually very well. Um, they do that throughout the state using that money. And uh, um, Simon Steck, you've been great with the Environmental Ch Protection Fund, a big supporter of that. Um, you know, land is a huge way to protect water quality. Um, you know, land trusts are not anti-development. Uh, they look to, you know, we all have really strict criteria as far as what land we protect. You know, we want to make sure, for us, it's a lot of wetlands, it's a lot of stream corridors, and the idea is if you don't have disturbances there, I mean, nature is the best way to filter water. You know, I mean, um, engineers strive to make, you know, what you know, the built environment like nature. Um, and again, I think everything you've heard here is exactly what is needed. And, you know, I, I for one, I mean, I live in Glens Falls, so Mayor Hall, yes, please give him money, please. <laughs> that, you know, um, and the same with Lake George. You know, I mean, if we protect all the land, that's great. But if the wastewater treatment plant doesn't have funding and isn't working, it doesn't mean anything. Um, you know, if road salt's going in, it doesn't mean anything. It, it's a concerted effort. It's a holistic effort. Um, but for us, you know, our part of all this is protecting the land that protects the lake. Um, you know, and it, it, as you heard, I mean, you know, we have great partners here. We work with the towns. We've bought land in partnership with a number of the municipalities here. And, you know, on top of it all, it's really kind of nice because once you protect the land, then you have economic benefit because you can go hiking on it and it also protects a really nice view. But, um, you know, again, what I would say as far as what you all can do is keep that environmental protection fund going. You know, uh, again, DEC, there's a portion in there where DEC buys money. There's a portion in there that funds land trusts, um, the conservation partnership program that helps us with capacity, that gives us uh, the ability to, to purchase more land with transaction grants as well as sort of help us uh, to build our capacity. Um, there's also some grants in there for farmland protection. Um, you know, there's some talk here about, you know, as far as I think over Lake Champlain, you know, there's a lot of work that land trusts do throughout the state working with farms to try to help with, you know, problems as far as runoff. Not just protecting land, but also managing their land. You know, conservation easements are a great tool that way. You know, we're not there to be auditors or say, don't do that. We're there to help them manage their land so that you don't have that phosphorus and things going through. Uh, we have several conservation easements here, and that's the idea. We want to help with uh, forest management and say, hey, this is the right way to do it, as opposed to just cutting it all down, and you got sediment and runoff going into the lake. So, you know, again, this is really, I think, Lake George is a great example of sort of, you know, a several-leg stool of how to do it. Um, you know, the, you heard the boat washing and the invasive stuff. That is great, and keep that money going too, please. Um, you know, it, it really... I, I'm not going to use this. I wanted to say it takes a village. I'm sorry for the cliche, but it really does. I mean, it's not one thing. And I think Lake George is a great model. You know, you, you talk a lot about like technological advances, but you can also look at very simple ways of doing it, like land protection or simple things, buffer strips. I mean, there's a lot of very simple ways, and you couple it with t the technological things. You know, Chris, Chris over there. I mean, he did a lot of great stuff. You know, with like this bio, um, you know, the bio. Um, what is it? Thank you. <laughs> you know, he does a lot of great stuff, and the LGA does a lot of great stu stuff, too, with restoration and education. So there's, there's a lot of good things, that, but it has to all come together. So when you're thinking about funding and programs, I would really stress to figure out ways and look at ways that it's all working together. That's the best way to do it, it is. So I, unlike everybody else that have very specific stuff, you know, and everything, I can just tell you that, that just from what I see, it has to all come together. You know, for us, it's land. But everything you've heard here really works in an integrated fashion. Thanks. Jamie, thank you. And, and, and thank you for <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the email that you sent with your written testimony earlier. That caught my eye, and it will be part of the record. Um, um, but and I don't remember the specific numbers. But uh, you you talked about the city of New York's watershed, right? And, uh, you know, the, how much a, a, a water filtration plant would have cost New York City, both as a capital outlay and the annual expense, right. versus a tiny fraction, really, of it to to uh, protect it, its reservoir system. And they got a waiver, and they were able to do that, and it seemed to be working okay for them.
them, but I mean, the, it was like a factor of 10 or Yeah, it was like 6 billion, I think, for the filtration system, and then, you know, 1.5 over like 20 or 30 years to purchase the land and protect it. Uh, and, you know, in fairness, they're also doing things with, just like here with septic systems and other things as well. But the bulk of it is, you know, protecting the land, and that's helping to purify the water. And again, why they were granted the waiver to not have to build the, fil the expensive filtration system. And then again, that was $300 million every year to maintain it on top right. of the and construction. That, real, that, that caught my eye when I saw that today. I, I, you know, I knew that's why they had acquired that land, but mm -hmm. it was a factor of four then, uh, just, just in the capital outlay, but then all that cost avoidance of not having to run a, a filtration plant. Right. And again, obviously some, you know, I and mean, it won't always work. You can't do it in every instance. Right. So Right. It's just, I, I think that just, you know, with the huge staggering numbers you're talking about, you know, the, the 80 billion, there may be other ways, alternative ways that we have to look at to try to, you know, think about other ways to do it that may be less expensive or alternatives that may be simpler, frankly, or, or less expensive. Thank you. Good point. Thank you. Got a question today. Sure. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that's, I mean, this is the whole point of, of these forums to really identify uh, the regional issues, specifically this capital region program or, or initiatives in place. And some of the things I was looking at before this task force kicked off was about also water re recapturing in, on private property, specifically that, that idea of where the, the methodologies that could be in place. And, there's, and states throughout the country have done pieces of it. And I was kind of looking at different state policies. I wanted to hear from you, Jamie, about if that's a, something that, or initiative that you've seen the Lake George area or beyond that something that we could apply statewide or even uh, part and parcel in certain regions or state, something that maybe, maybe applies specifically here in the capital region is a rain recapturing program uh, for private properties or commercial properties. Have you at all thought about something like that or have you, is, are you involved in any initiatives like that with the land use, any, anything like that? I, I mean, I, I haven't. I feel like I'm not sure if if Walt, just please go ahead. Just look at the Onondaga County Save the Rain program. It's tremendous, one of the best presentations I've ever heard. It's Onondaga so Save the Rain Save program. program. Take a look at it. Thank you. Because every time that we've done, the Lake Shore Association has done a uh, rain barrel program where we've given them away or gotten a grant to give them away, they have gone very Very You get people in the watershed who are interested in stopping right. stormwater from getting into the Right. So it's been very, very popular. Mm -hmm. Now, when you guys all leave, my colleague here said, you lost control of that room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that your, your, um, your, you. Uh, you know, your ideas of, of looking elsewhere, you know, because to be blunt, I always look at other land trusts and other states for ideas. And I mean, that's a great idea because there's no need to reinvent the wheel. And, right. you know, uh, what is that? Copying is the bit, biggest part of flattery or, or whatever that is. So I, you're on the right track. So. Jamie, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Good work. Thank you. Supervisor Dickinson, the supervisor of the great town of Lake George. You didn't think you were going to get out of my house. It's a good house. <laughs> yeah. He even stayed awake. I'm glad he did. Yeah. It was tough. Rock's not good. <laughs> no, really. These are my friends. <laughs> 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 it wasn't really difficult to stay awake. These are important issues for us in the town. Um, I'm going to reiterate what Supervisor Weinmiller told you. Dan and some of the participants here have stolen some of my thunder, but the town and village of Lake George are in the midst of a major stormwater or sewer project. The sewage treatment plant's owned by the village. The village has 998 residents, men, women, and children total. The town of Lake George, they extended the sewer collection system, town and village, out into the town in 1952. Our sewer district, Caldwell Sewer District, in the town is the same size as the village's. So we basically share all the expenses 50-50. It is not our treatment plan. We are not running the show. We are riding the coattails of the village. It is a 24 $25 million project. It is presently underway 
with almost no funding. We have like four or five million dollars allocated out of 24 or 25 million. We are looking at tripling people's sewer bills. I don't see it. I don't see how we can do that. I've been very reluctant, I was very reluctant to start the project, not knowing where we're gonna get any money from. We have uh, some grants still in the works. Uh, we've had some, some indication that we were gonna get more money, how much we don't know. But to have money set aside that's more readily available, that's enough to do these projects, not enough to get us in trouble, but enough to do them. Uh, and that's what I, I see. We don't have, we might have enough to do this project, but our debt service is gonna be, it's gonna be terrible for, for the people here. Um, so I was really interested to hear that, and I would really promote that. Uh, I, I think that would be great. Um, we have a professional uh, grant person on our payroll in the town of Lake George. He's brought in probably four or five million dollars in the last few years, 25 years old. Does a great job for us. We did a seven million dollar project. He did paperwork, he'd bring paperwork down an inch stick two or three times a week and we'd fill it out. Uh, so grant, grants are a good thing. They're not free money. There's always a catch, there's always strings. Um, We've had some grants that we've actually returned because they're not beneficial enough for us to, to go out and loan for them. Um, but the grant system seems to be working all right. It is difficult, it's difficult to compete. Uh, they give money to people that just blow your mind and then when you come, you can't get any. The, the Village of Lake George is under a mandate from the DEC, state DEC, to redo the plant, to meet and uh, nitrate discharge. Not only are we under a mandate from them, a legal mandate to, to do that, they have tripled the requirements for the village of Lake George on nitrates. The only, only facility in the entire state of New York. So uh, our plan is top of the line, it'll last us 50 years, if not 100, uh, it's the best of everything and uh, has a lot of capacity and will solve a lot of our problems, but we need to be able to pay for it. So I'm pleading with you. I've talked to Dan, I'm blue in the well, face. You can I, see I, that coming. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, Supervisor is right. Uh, they've been working hard to, to try to secure every nickel of grant money they, they can lay their hands on and they've got more um, lines in the water right now that they're, they're hoping, but uh, this has been, for the benefit of my three colleagues that aren't following this locally in the media, um, this has been a source of great anxiety, not just for the supervisor and the town board and the village board and the mayor, but you know, everybody in the region, and, and, and it's beyond uh, a, a Lake George uh, village and town concern. This is a regional concern because of the importance that Lake George has to the region's economy. So. While you know taxpayers in Queensbury might not get, be getting a sewer bill, um, you know the success uh, of of their infrastructure in, in Lake George Village will will impact the success or lack thereof, uh, um, you know, on the, the economic draw that you know Lake George is for tourists. Um, like I said, it's a thousand in the village, um, and there may be two thousand users, and on the system when you factor in the town's district, but. Uh, you know, I mean, thirty thousand people will, you know, will be walking the streets on any given day in the summer. Absolutely. Um, and then, and if they can't flush the toilets, then thirty thousand people won't be walking around. Correct. So, thanks for sticking around for us tonight, Dennis. Not a problem. As always. Glad to have you. All right, so we're after eight. I said we'd stay, but I'm just noting the time. And a couple of them, I I, I could walk home and get there faster than Mike can. Um, but, uh, but we'll, you know, if there's anyone else that wants to address this, yes, ma'am, please just come on up and, and uh, Before I like, leave, I'd like to say I really appreciate it on behalf of the town and the village, the four of you coming here and having this. Uh, we really appreciate it. Obviously, the, the people appreciated it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Yes, ma'am.
Hi, my name is Liz Moran. I'm the Environmental Policy Director for NYPIRG, the New York Public Interest Research Group. Um, I will absolutely keep this brief, but no, thank you so much. You <laughs> Nice to meet you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, I was very excited to hear my report reference this evening. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with NYPIRG, um, we are a nonpartisan, non-for-profit research and advocacy organization. Um, I'm based in our Albany office, but we do have an office in New York City as well. We also have a sister organization with a number of student chapters at SUNY and CUNY schools, as well as a couple private schools. Um, so the closest to here would probably be our chapter in SUNY New Paltz, and we also have a chapter at um, SUNY ESF. Um, so the public has a basic right and expectation that when they turn on the taps, their water is going to be safe for them to drink. We have this expectation that we'll be able to swim and be safe when we go into water bodies in New York State, um, but we still have a lot of work to do to get there. And a, a number of people have already testified about where New York State currently is. Um, so I'll keep it brief to demonstrate this point a little bit further, but of course, New York State is facing the consequences of climate change. That means more frequent rain events, which is straining our old water infrastructure, as well as exacerbating harmful algal blooms. Um, emerging contaminants have been mentioned a number of times this evening. And uh, we found that of emerging contaminants that have most recently been tested for, um, uh, millions of New Yorkers are impacted. Um, for PFOA and PFOS, um, 1.2 million New Yorkers have been exposed to drinking levels that exceed EPA's health guidance levels, um, and uh, 2.8 million for 1,4-dioxane. Um, aging water infrastructure is leading to sewage overflows. Um, 20 billion gallons are discharged around New York City every year, 4 billion uh, into waterways around Buffalo, and then for the capital region, 1.2 billion is uh, contributed to the Hudson River every year. Um, but the uh, 2021 uh, fiscal year uh, offers a tremendous opportunity to do more. We've made a lot of progress over the years through the Clean Water Infrastructure Act. A number of uh, tremendous policies were passed this past year, um, and in the 2017 uh, legislative session following uh, Hoosick Falls and Newburgh coming to light, a number of important uh, water reforms were passed. So I think there's a lot of work going to be done to build on them. So I'm just going to quickly, because I did submit written testimony, so I'll quickly outline what we're recommending. And your report it was informative. Uh, you know, I want to thank you too. That, that report was an eye-opener for me. Oh, thank so, you so yeah, much. Yeah. It was... Um, Six million New Yorkers, uh, their, their water is not being tested uh, by anybody. Some of them are private wells, but the, some, and uh, the, there's, there's a mandate that larger systems be tested, you know, with greater frequency than smaller, but, but you know, no one should assume that every water, even public water source is being tested. And I think a lot of people, and this, we are not keeping up with our own imposed on testing. I mean, your report really, and oh yeah, I'll cite the report. <laughs> Thank you, it's nice to meet you. Thank, Thank you, you so tonight. much. Yeah, we are still recommending the state move forward with the law passed in 2017 that would require statewide emerging contaminant testing. We yeah, also... That's going to be expensive. That was the other thing I took away. It's like, wow, you know, that's going to get expensive fast. And there, there will be a discussion yeah. about how much, how much is public health worth. And we, you know, but I mean, we should, right. uh, you know, one of my frustrations is uh, all, all too often we will pass a law down there because somebody's pushing for it and, and it's a good idea, but there's no follow through. There's no, you know, I mean, it, it, this looks great on paper, but if, we're, if we have no sincere intention to enforce it, whether it's a, a testing mandate or whatever, you know, it may not even be environmental. Just you, you pass something, there should be an expectation at the local level. You know, our, our you know, there's a, a law firm that represents several towns around here, and I remember the guidance that I got at the town level, um, and I'm sure they gave it. Is like, you know, you, you really you shouldn't pass a law if you don't plan on enforcing it. You know, if you if you can't enforce it, or you're not planning on enforce it, don't pass it. And, um, you know, I mean, we've we've got these requirements to test. And yep. we're not testing, and 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 it's going to come down to this costs a lot of money. Well, then maybe we should have thought that through before we. And I'm mm -hmm. not saying that testing is not a good thing, but you, you you can't say, hey, look what we did. We just made this mandatory, and then ignore the what's mandatory. What we right. just made mandatory. Yeah. So we are recommending a dramatic increase to the Clean Water Infrastructure Act. Um, you cited the 80 billion figure mm -hmm. that's 
estimated for just hard infrastructure over the next 20 years that doesn't include the numerous other important initiatives that are funded by that program, including source water protection plans, so land acquisition, um, addressing harmful algal blooms, septic systems, lead service line replacement. Those are all things within the Clean Water Infrastructure Act, so it's stretched too thin. So we're recommending that at a minimum, um, a billion should be invested in the Clean Water Infrastructure Act every year, so that way it can help with things like water testing, but also replace that hard infrastructure, which is the reason why that pot was created to begin with. If I could interrupt, do you have an opinion? I, I'll put you on the spot, I apologize. Uh, do you have an opinion on the, the swap, uh, you know, the uh, the formula, um, that, that, that legislation that we mentioned previously? Yeah, I've had questions in the past about how exactly that formula would be shaped, but we're not opposed to the concept. Okay. Um, what we would urge is that something like that doesn't replace the grant program and supplements sure. the, the grant right. program. Yeah, and that's fair too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, continue on. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, so just outlining the recommendation, so you already mentioned a couple, the funding and uh, implementing emerging contaminant testing. We also are recommending that private well testing is a piece of legislation <coughs> passed this year. Um, we are urging for stronger protections for um, class uh, C streams and wetlands. Um, both are pieces of legislation that exist. Um, and we do recommend our public water database become something that the state adopts. They've made some progress there where they have some uh, annual water reports available online now, um, but it's not as extensive as actually what our database is still offering. We have emerging contaminant data online as well, and. Um, more information for smaller water systems. The state hasn't done that yet. Um, we also are urging an increase to the Environmental Protection Fund. Um, for this coming year, along with a number of partners, we're recommending at least 350 million, with a goal of increasing eventually to 500 million. And um, we strongly urge increases to DEC and Department of Health staffing to implement all of these laws. Um, it's been a long time where they've gone very understaffed. So we are urging um, staffing levels to be up to snuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for sticking Thank around for us. It's a pleasure to meet you. Liz, can I just ask you a question? Yeah. The, the Class C streams and wetlands, didn't we have some legislation in the Environmental Conservation Committee that we put forward uh, acknowledging the streams and wetlands, or is that a lower? No, I don't know if it made it to the floor for a vote. It didn't make it to the floor <coughs> for a vote, but it did move through committee. I believe Class C streams passed the Senate this past year. Um, wetlands, I think the assembly has passed before. It's a bill that's been around for a little while. Yeah, we're for it to get to the floor, but that's yeah. So, event, okay. and it's something we're urging because um, I, I think a lot of people have been following this in this room at least. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of uh, regulations up in the air regarding the waters of the U.S. Mm -hmm. So we think it's really important the state steps in and makes sure our wetlands are protected, both to protect our water quality <coughs> and also to mitigate climate change. And flooding impacts. Just also the 350 million to EPA, is that also including the staffing or would that be an addition, additional funding for just the staffing increases? That's separate. So, that would um, be separate. Okay. yeah, yeah, that would be a separate line. Okay. And what about you um, talking about with the rivers, uh, waterways? Combined sewage outflows, I know, are a huge issue downstate, but up here in the capital region, I'm assuming. That's a that's major, the, that's falls, the, uh, that's that's a major problem yeah. with that. Do you have any uh, recommendations? Nyper, do you have any recommendations with the CSOs up here? Any sort of additional? Policy yeah, ideas? yeah. Um, CSOs are very common upstate as well because the old cities. That's what they used. Yeah. Um, so you know that's why we are advocating for more funding for the Clean Water Infrastructure Act. Um, we do strongly support, there is a small line for green infrastructure within that funding program. Um, so we always support measures like that to reduce the amount of storm water ending up in so combined sewer systems. Way, then, just kind of increasing that line to be more uh, earmarked for the CSO issue? Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, I think more funding would help. Us, uh, because a number of DCs actually um, have consent orders to reduce their sewage right. overflows as well. Um, so we think increased funding can help them get into compliance. But line item for that issue. I guess that's all I'm saying is more just be, rather than just increased funding in general sense, more how to increase funding earmarked for specific issues so that mm. that money can 
in terms of the breakdown. Correct. Yeah, so the way it's broken down right now, the largest portion is going towards hard water infrastructure. Um, so the whole program is the Clean Water Infrastructure Act. Yeah. Within that is, and what actually started the whole program, was the waste, the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act of 2015. That grant pot is still in there. That does get the largest portion. We'd recommend the same portions. Um, we don't want very important things to be competing with one another. Um, but that said, the whole pot has to dramatically increase. Was it your report as well that pointed out that um, the how quickly the grant funding isn't going out the door? Like about half of, um, maybe it wasn't because the, the the look that you're giving me. No, I know which report you're talking about. It's not ours. It's not your. But am I right? Yes. So like roughly half. I mean, so we, we've 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 identified. Oh, I've got. I, I'll have to look it up. But Environmental Advocates of New York. That, uh, is I think it was. It was. Yeah. And, and, and over the last three years since we've established this funding stream and, and grown it, um, you know, th th their, their applicants are tracking with the increase, but we, we haven't maxed out the, yeah. you know, and now it may just be a matter of, in the, the, you know, the, uh, local municipalities need to catch up with the program, but we, we've funded it and, it, and um, the, all the funding that's been allocated for it hasn't gone out yet. So there's, there's funding. There's still uh, money on the table. Still so it's oversubscribed. The grant program is significantly oversubscribed. It's a meeting about half of the people applying, and that's not okay, necessarily right. You've got more applicants. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we're advocating for more funding because it's actually not meeting the need. Um, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, but no, I understand the confusion um, because there's always concerns that there's money, but it's not going out the door. We haven't heard that concern with this particular program. It seems like it's keeping up with the need. That's the bigger right. issue, and right. making sure there's staff and resources to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anyone else this evening? Yes, Mr. Harrington. So Mr. Chris Harrington is the, I don't know what his title is anymore. He is the director of Queensbury's water and wastewater guy. So he, I used to be his boss many years ago. And he, he knows a lot more about water and wastewater than I ever will. Thank you, Dan. Um, yeah, Chris Harrington, town of Queensbury, uh, water superintendent and director of wastewater. I'm a licensed engineer, I'm a grade 1A operator, and I'm also a D operator. Uh, I have about 25 years in the business, and I actually have to run these systems. Um, I've heard a lot of people speak about advocating for them, the funding, and one of the questions I really have. I, I don't know where you can get the funding. Um, I know tomorrow you'll probably have a meeting with the education people who need more funding, and the day after that, disability people who need more funding. It never ends. Um, He's figured out our line of work. <laughs> He's cracked the code. Um, we're fortunate in Queensbury that, you know, it's been blessed with really good people running. I mean, I think, I think that's the key with a lot of these things. I think uh, on a local level, you need to make sure that you pay the people to uh, run these systems. We have Tom Flaherty, we have Ralph Anduzzi, yeah. and uh, now I've taken the mail. Um, I'm a member of the Water Utility Council. I believe that you, you, you met with uh, Phil Tangoro. He sp spoke the other day at Herkimer. Um, what we want to make sure as utilities, that you are using science to come up with the MCLs. Okay, I, I'm very worried that we're having advocates who all mean very well hijack the system. Okay, um, I see it, uh, you know, what is exactly an MCL? There used to be a very strict way of how the federal government, through the Safe Drinking Water Act, would determine what the MCL is. Um, we're throwing numbers out. And I want to make sure that um, we're putting some science behind it. Cancer rates are very difficult to find out how are you getting them. You know, down on Long Island, I believe 30 years ago, breast cancer was a big thing that the environment <coughs> was causing it. They can't pin it. We just had a, another report up here with the health department saying that smoking and bad Cause lifestyles cause are cancer. causing the cancer. Mm. I know people are disappointed in that because it's got to be the environment. It's got to be the water. It's got to be the air. We need to take some responsibility for our actions, and we also have to understand it's a very complex situation. The thing I don't like is water is a very easy matrix to look at and study. You have a lot of people making money, PhDs, with a lot of grants to take water, and they're finding things parts per trillion. And we're not sure what they really do. But nobody wants to stuff in the water. It is impossible, folks. We will never get down to zero. And again, we at the Water Utility Council want to make sure that science has ruled going forward, the science will have an impact down the road. Um, some other things I see is in California, 
PG and E is cutting the electricity. Gavin Newsom, Governor Newsom getting in front, he's blaming the utility. He's saying they didn't do enough the past 10 years to do what they needed to do. I laugh at that because I, as a utility, if I want to raise the rates, I get the local politicians say, no, we can't raise the rates. We're going to push it down the road. We have to hold the utility. When they come and we speak to you, we need to adjust the rates and not push things down the road. We can't just do these things. And who's going to pay for it? If I'm up in the lower Podunk, out of our town, and I have a well, I have my septic, it works well. Part of me is like, why am I paying my state tax money to fund their problem because they ignored it for 50 years? There's something in that Gatsby 34 called depreciation. We should be putting money away, Queen Town of Queensbury, $900,000 a year. We should be paying for the future. We don't do these little things. I never had the Department of Health come in, let me see your books. We put enough money. In. We don't do these things. Then we say, hey, we need more money. I don't know where it's coming from. Governor Cuomo, moratorium on the natural gas, Con Edison and National Grid, a thousand hookups. They don't have natural gas. They're stopping the natural gas line from being built in New York State with permits. Governor Cuomo strong arms the PSC to tell them, hook up the natural gas. What's going to happen this winter when gas goes up and there's not enough of gas? These are the things we need to do and not put a barrier in, uh, our head in the sand and say, somebody's going to come up with a solution, somebody's going to pay for it. We all need to do a little bit and make sure that our local people hire the people and do the right thing. One for dioxin, down on Long Island. Paul Granger and Joe Picorni from the Suffolk County Water Authority are very concerned we don't have the best management practice. Advanced oxygen process, they're not sure how well it works. They want to make an MCL of, I believe, one in, within a year? I mean, it's, it's the, there's a lot that goes in this. You need vendor capacity, you need engineering capacity, you need contractor capacity. What we're asking for is that things are staged appropriately so that the Long Island water utilities don't have to put on water restrictions next year. Because they're talking about doing that, because they're saying, we cannot put out water above an MCL because our insurance company is not going to cover us. Mm -hmm. So these are the things you have to think about, about how are you going to manage these problems without being a knee-jerk reaction to the advocates. Again, we need to address these things. But we need to do it in a programmatic and engineering Wait, Dan, you're an engineer, and that's the way we think. We're always sitting back like, well, how are we going to do this? It's going to take time. So again, as part of the Water Utility Council, as a guy who actually makes the water, processes the water, distributes the water, it is not easy. And the regulations are coming down the pipe. The red, lead and copper rule will be revised. That's going to be a big, bigger burden on utilities. We have the disinfection byproduct rule. We have uh, Legionella will be a problem. I honestly believe that they're going to look at that, and that's going to cause more issues. And people are going to say, oh, our water is becoming a disaster. We have all these regulations, they're fighting with each other, and we're going to have more issues down the road. Even though I will swear, if you saw a monthly report from 1986, what we used to produce, the water quality we have today is far superior than the stuff people in Queensbury were drinking in 1986. There's no question it's bad. But unfortunately, the sky is falling and our water is worse. It, it, I don't believe that for one second. We have work to do, we can do it, we need to do it in a hopefully professional, programmatic way, and not a knee-jerk reaction. So, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. And, uh, See, as you can imagine, Chris was fun to work with. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, but I, you know, and I, all, I, I, all kidding aside, Chris, I always appreciate working with you. I know John does as well, because he's very direct and, and logical in his approach. And you're absolutely right. We, we, there's no room for being arbitrary and setting a limit. Uh, you know, that needs to be based in science as well. Um, we, I, we will never be drinking distilled water coming out of corn. You don't want to. And, and you don't want to anyways. Right. I mean, so, right. so the, you know, there will be impurities. The question always is what, where, how many, you know, and, and that should be based on, on, on science of health and, and you know, and, and the engineering of producing water. Again, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. You.
Anybody else? We're going to close with Chris Harrington. Awesome. John, thanks for bringing him tonight. All right. Um, I'm mindful of the hour. Yep. All right. Come on up. Uh, Ron Conover is the supervisor of the town of Bolton, which is the town that, the town immediately to the north of us here. Um, he's the one with the biodigester. The rock stars that come to the region stay in his town, and he's the chairman of the county board of supervisors. Right. I just um, thank you for that introduction. You're welcome. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank all of you for being here. And I think that as I'm sitting back and I'm listening uh, to this, um, it's uh, clear to me that what you're doing is a really a genuine outreach because I think you recognize that at least part of the answer, if there is one, lies out in the municipal level. At the municipal level, the people that are dealing with these issues day in and day out, um, both from a scientific point of view and an economic point of view. Uh, we just did, uh, we're in the process of completing a capital infrastructure uh, survey of Warren County. We may be one of the only counties doing it on such a comprehensive way. And this includes all the towns in the village, it includes the city. Um, <clears throat> and um, last I looked, uh, the number was approaching $220 million of priority projects in a county of 65,000 people. Wow. So, let's take that and let's think about that across the whole of New York State. I mean, it's, the, the, the demand here is, and it's not counting the state infrastructure, which of course you're also responsible for. Uh, so it is a daunting, daunting challenge just to even think about what the number must be. Uh, and much of that is sewer and water, of course. And um, so let me just thank you once again for being here. Thank you for coming to Warren County. Thanks, uh, if we can be of any assistance, you know, please don't hesitate to ask. If you're looking for a tour of the bioreactor, be happy to take down a tour of the bioreactor. Um, and share whatever information we have. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, we'll wrap it up quickly with closing remarks, and why don't we go in reverse order, and we'll start with Assemblyman Ashby. Well, I just want to thank everybody for coming out today, uh, advocates, innovators, local leaders. Uh, it was certainly a good use of my time, and uh, you know, I was struck with uh, Chris's remarks you know, towards the end. And in my district, not only do we have uh, you know, issues in Hoosick, but uh, Dewey Lofel in Nassau. Uh, you know, citizens over there have been advised to be drinking bottled water since 1954 because of what was going on. And trying to set uh, MCLs for 1,4 dioxane over there and getting everybody to participate has, you know, it's still going on. And this is, you know, half a century, you know, going on here. So it's, uh, I am excited to see, uh, you know, what our, uh, party is doing and what you know this task force is doing and our colleagues you know across the aisle and I'm hopeful that uh, you know we can, we can get a grip on this but it's imperative that everybody come out to events like this and, and share the information so thank you Mary Beth. yeah no I just want to say the, the hour is getting kind of late um, I've really learned quite a bit it's funny um, when I did my introduction, I talked about being the ranker on education, but as I'm sitting listening to everybody, it's like, oh yeah, I came up through town government. You know, I, I, it was reminding me of working on our Lake Overlay District or um, just the, the myriad issues that we dealt with at a, at a town level when I sat on the Saratoga County Water Authority. So a lot, a lot of things, make the concept of making water. I just had to laugh when, uh, when Chris was just talking. I never understood that as you know, a verb, um, but it's true, you, you make water. And um, anyway, it was very interesting to me. I think I wrote down a couple of uh, ideas that I think we have. I, I would just like to say that um, in ter like, as members of the assembly minority, we don't develop the budget. We certainly can advocate for what we think funding priorities are, but I think really what we offer um, and really try to offer is that we consider ourselves to be the conference of ideas. We, we really do believe in doing this kind of outreach because uh, we can, if we can take your ideas and kind of synthesize it, travel around the state, put together a report, and put that report out there, we, we hope, and it's, it's our advocacy piece, to hope that those in the majority and those on the second floor, that person on the second floor, will, when developing the budget, will consider these, these important initiatives. So, 
I, I don't I, I also believe that it was a very good use of my time this evening and I thank you for um, your participation everybody thanks and in, in regard to the report though I mean historically what's come from these task forces uh, and the reports that have been generated in the various uh, subjects that our conference has taken on does get picked up and, yeah. and cherry picked and plagiarized and that's okay and that's fine. Um, by the majority and makes their way into law um, and often oftentimes so they, they they won't admit it but uh, but they'll 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 use this report this report will be very public and uh, it'll be used across the aisle and in the other chamber um, because uh, our conference's work product is that good Mike thank you everybody this is a real privilege to be up here at Capital Region as I said from the, uh, the downstate guy, as the three of them made clear this evening. Uh, it was something that I was very pleased with to hear from. Uh, the main reason I got in, I wanted to be a chair of this, of this task force is because it's about being proactive. It's about being ahead of the game before waiting until it's too late. And for me, as you can tell, I'm a young guy and I want to have it where 20, 30 years from now, I don't want to have it where I said I should have done something back then. I want to have it where we took the initiative to say, let's do it now because we realize what's going to be the ramifications later on for our children and our grandchildren. So I'm really pleased to hear these issues. I'm looking forward to really seeing them materialize next year. And you can 100% count on our support to advocate because we got fire here. And we're not afraid to show it, especially in the legislature. So thanks, everybody. Have a great night. And, and I'll close by, you know, thanking my friends. You know, I, I know just about everybody here uh, tonight. Um, but for the benefit of my colleagues, I'm sure it came across in the last couple hours. But I'm, I'm very proud of the municipal um, uh, leadership that we have here, the environmental leadership that we have here, the business leadership that we have here. Um, I like to showcase a lot of the successes that we've had in Lake George. And, you know, it, it's not to say that, uh, you know, I mean, the rest of the water and wastewater infrastructure needs are not akin to a lot of, the, I knew that tonight's discussion would uh, tend to focus more around a, a lake issues, but that's part of our, our mandate and our charge um, as well. But, um, but the, uh, the proactiveness of, of the local leadership here uh, on a lot of fronts, and in particular, a lot of fronts relevant to, um, to water quality in the lake, uh, something that I was proud to showcase uh, tonight. So I'm glad that, um, you know, I mean, these are many of the people that spoke tonight are people that I worked with uh, for the last 20 years um, in the local level. And uh, uh, so I knew that we would get a lot out of the discussion tonight, and I'm sure that we, we did. Um, they'll, they'll debrief me later. Um, but, uh, you know, thank you for coming out. I want to thank our staff.